To skip the story and go straight to the explanation and a summary of this SCP, go to this timestamp. Good day everyone and welcome to SCP-1730. Over the next few hours you are going to witness a level of storytelling that most modern day film writers can only dream of matching. This SCP is a testament to the creativity of the SCP community and I am honoured to bring it to you. So grab a drink, get comfortable, shout out to my amazing patrons and all the people that helped in the making of this video and sit back and enjoy SCP-1730 written by DJ Cactus. The following is the SCP-1730 data file as it appeared before its reclassification as neutralised. Some inconsistencies may persist. Description SCP-1730 is a large complex of structures 15 kilometres northwest of the US-Mexico border within Big Bend Ranch State Park that was discovered on June 5th. Due to the isolated nature of the complex and the low survival rate of individuals who come in contact with it, it is possible that SCP-1730 had been previously discovered but unreported. SCP-1730 bears identifying markings and contains documents to support the claim that SCP-1730 was at one point Foundation Site-13, originally located near Nome, Alaska. This conflicts with current records which show that Site-13 was a project that while intended to be constructed in Nome, was scrapped for the larger and more advanced Site-19 and never completed. Flora located on site have been tracked back to those native to the Alaskan region. How SCP-1730 came to be at its current location is unknown. SCP-1730 is in a severe state of disrepair and appears to have been left abandoned for an extended period of time. The site power generator has continued to operate in a damaged state despite a number of fuel leaks and fires throughout the facility. This has resulted in intermittent power failures throughout the site, hindering exploration and rescue efforts. The origin of SCP-1730 is unknown, as is the nature of many of the anomalous entities contained within. It is confirmed that the 2nd through 15th basement levels were utilised for entity containment, though the state of that containment has deteriorated significantly. It is believed that a contingent of human survivors exists somewhere deep in the lower basement levels of the facility. Messages written in English have been discovered throughout the site, consisting of warnings such as danger and death here and other messages such as not my body and bleed. A recurring message, what happened to Site 13, has been found in several different locations in the basements. Several logs of data have been collected by the remaining functional site terminals, the relevant data of which is contained in the attached addendums. Worth noting is that inconsistencies exist between the logs and what has been determined through exploration, including site layout, staff makeup and contained anomalies. Special Containment Procedures A circular perimeter has been established 2 km from SCP-1730 and a quarantine zone has been established 1 km from SCP-1730. Personnel who are to enter SCP-1730 must first undergo Class 7 hazardous contact preparation measures, including the application of a modified Maxwell Harden hazardous material reinforced airtight suit. The application of these protective measures may only take place at the provisional Site-23 quarantine main gate. Individuals attempting to exit the quarantined area must first submit to thorough decontamination protocols as administered by the quarantine security staff. Individuals failing to meet the quarantine extraction parameters are to be held for further decontamination or, in the event decontamination becomes unfeasible, termination. Addendum 1731 Recovered Log Team, Charlie Yukon, Assignment, Site-13 Recovery, Lead, CY-1. Begin log. We found it. Watched it kill Daly earlier. Crawled right into his mouth, and next thing you know, Daly's got blood leaking out of his ears. Puking it up, shitting it out, everywhere. Blood looked funny, too. Too dark. It was running out of his hair, like, through the follicles. His hair fell out right with it. Once it was over, the thing that crawled inside him crawled back out with a buddy. One of them, can't say which, drinks up all this blood like a leech. The other one crawls back inside daily and he stands up. Turns around, starts coming at us. I can see that thing inside him when he opens his mouth. So I put a bullet in his face. We emptied our magazines into him. He did get up after that. We're not going to be too much longer, though. Found another one of those messages down here, you know. 
Just a matter of time before it starts. We strapped some C4 to it and blew the wall, and I think it's pretty illegible at this point. But it doesn't matter. Jones already went quiet like the others. We shoved him down an elevator shaft earlier. Didn't hear the body hit the ground. I think I just heard him start up Thresher. I wish we would have known about that sooner. Oh well. Addendum 1732 recovered automated message. The following message was recovered from SCP-1730's emergency warning system. Logs on file indicate that it was transmitted moments prior to a major electrical disturbance and three minutes before an explosion within the site power relay. General notice. Site 13 has experienced a gross breach of containment systems. Has breached containment during testing. On-site nuclear device is non-responsive. Thresher protocol has been activated. Life support systems, online. Electrical systems, offline. Fire control systems, offline. Flood control systems, offline. Reactor status, critical. Euclid class containment status, critical. Keter class containment status, compromised. Addendum 1733, Exploration Log Transcripts Log 1, Date, Exploration Team, Mobile Task Force D-12 Mudslingers, Team Lead, D-12 Captain, Team Members, D-12-1 to D-12-5, Begin Log. Recorders on, everybody check your mics. Check. 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 Check, check. check. And check makes five. Great. Right. Come on, do you hear us clear? Roger that, Team Lead. All right, we're set. Keep weapons locked. No idea what we're going to see in there. Let's move in. Those doors. The team moves into the main SCP-1730 structure through the front doors. The doors are found to be unlocked. Keep your eyes open. Dark in here. Switching lights. Good call. The team switches on their shoulder-mounted lights. Something written on the wall over here. Yeah, here too. What you got? Get below and... Don't look at the walls next to it. Little late for that. What about you two? What did we do? You see that command? Yes. All right, let's move on out. Service elevator over there. Five, check if it has power. Yeah, this will work. Let's see how far it'll take us then. The team enters the service elevator. Video indicates lit control panel with various floor buttons. The captain hits a button labelled B3. The elevator descends briefly. It stops upon reaching the third basement level. The door opens to reveal a dark hallway. A single light is on at a bend in the hall roughly 50 metres from the elevator. Okay, let's clear this level first. Then we can go from there. One and three take that hallway there. Myself and four can check the rooms in this hallway. And two and five stay here. Make sure our elevator sticks around. The team splits up. D-12-1 and 3 move towards the light at the end of the hallway. The captain begins checking the rooms on the left side of the hallway. D-12-4 checks the right side. Rooms are filthy. What is this? Yeah, I see it too. Is it mud? Feels like it. Some kind of sludge. Smells metallic. I'll send this back up, I command. Let you guys poke around in it. Acknowledged. Try and keep out of it as much as you can until we figure out what it is. Sure thing. We're at the end of this hallway. Another hallway here. Looks like there's some kind of barricade at the end. Bunch of tables and desks all piled up. Can you approach the barricade, one? D-12-1 and 3 approach the barricade. More of the sludge in this room. Caked on the walls and found a body. Hang tight. One, don't move. I'm coming for. The captain enters the room. A visible humanoid body is seen half-submerged in the thick black material in a corner. The head and neck are not visible. Yep. Any kind of identification? He's got a spot on his belt for a badge, but it's... missing. Looks pulled off. Maybe to unlock a door somewhere? Maybe. Go ahead and proceed, one. Aye. Cap, more bodies here. That sludge is all over the back of this barricade. Shit, that one moved! There's something else in this pile. Get a light on it. Moving your way, guys. Uh, there! Fuck! Report, guys. We're getting to you. 
thing crawled out of one of their mouths. Some kind of snake, I think. A lot of teeth. Can't really tell what it is now. Look here! You hit that body, see that? Fuck! It's hollow. The captain and D-12-4 arrive at the barricade. You see in this command? Affirmative. Alright, much for that then, I guess. Weapons hot, if they aren't already. Aye, aye. Let's head back to the elevator. See if we can get down to the next level. Is that door in... Yeah, I thought so. Let's just do that then. The captain, D-12-1, 3 and 4 move back down the hallway. Wait a second. Didn't this turn left earlier? Sure did. Where's the elevator? 2-5, you read me? 2-5, you read me? Uh, here we go. Shut it. Alright, shit. Come on, you read us? Sure do, Captain. You got a read on 2 and 5? Should be about 45 meters to your 12. There's a wall here. Looks like it's always been here. Either we're hallucinating or the building is doing something fucky either way. Can you get a hold of either of them? A hey, moment. Site Command attempts to communicate with D-12-2 and 5, neither of whom are responsive. No go. Ugh, oh, shit. Let's find a way up and get out of here then. The D-12 team proceeds down a hallway. The hallway is much longer than any on any recovered schematic of the site. Got something else on this door. What's that? It says silence. We trying to check this? Is this a containment cell? That's just an office door. This whole floor just looks like offices. Alright then, get in there. D-12-1 attempts to open the door. It's locked. I can't get it open. Knock the door down then. You hear that? One. Two. It sounds like somebody's shushing. Three. D-12-1 kicks the door down. Video records three frames of a naked human with what appears to be fire burning out of their ears, staring fearfully at the door. Fuck! There is an intense white light and the sound of searing meat. All camera lenses are damaged and become non-functional. All microphones except for that of D-12-3 stop working. What happened? Captain, D-12 team. Site Command attempts to communicate with the team captain for an additional 30 seconds before realizing that D-12-3's mic is still operational. D-12-3, can you hear us? D-12-3. D-12-3? A cry is heard, then the sound of choking. This continues for 43 seconds, and then the sound of liquid leaking, then pouring, accompanied by the sound of vomit is heard. Large, wet objects can be overheard hitting the floor. A dull, low, approaching sound accompanies this. D-12-3's mic cuts out suddenly. D-12-3. Shit. Sir, come on. Jesus Christ. What? D-12-2? Where are you right now? By the elevator. We assumed our radios had stopped working down here. We're just waiting for them to get back. The rest of the team is compromised. Hang on. We're trying to establish a link to your video. No need for that. It's probably just interference. Can you set the team down here to get us? Hang on. Video coming up. Don't. Got it, you. Mounted cameras on both individuals do not show the hallway they had been standing in, but what looks like a large utility room. Boilers are visible in the near distance, and a wall appears to have been caved in. D-12-2 appears to be hanging upside down facing D-12-5, both of whom are stark white and unmoving. Their faces are covered in blood that looks to have originated from their mouth, nostrils and eyes. A large object is seen moving quickly behind D-12-2, accompanied by the sound of slithering from many different sources. D-12-5 opens his eyes. Two frames later, the video and audio feed cuts out. No additional responses are picked up from the D-12 team. End log. Addendum 1733, Exploration Log Transcript Log 3. Date. Exploration Team, Mobile Task Force Y-24, Gulliver's Travelers. Team Lead, Y-24 Captain, Team Members, Y-24-1, Y-24-2. Notes. Initial exploration of the main site structure proved too dangerous for an additional attempt without additional resources. The only remaining mobile task force on hand was Mobile Task Force Y-24, a three-person team who was charged with entering the site power station and assessing the damage. Begin log. Coming online. The video and audio feed for all three members comes online simultaneously. Ahead of them is the entrance to the SCP-1730 power station. You can hear us? Affirmative. Good. Anything else we should know? 
Thermal scans read one of the cores is being superheated. Might be on the verge of an explosion. Stay as far away from them as you can. You can use the micro drones if you need to. Don't worry about trying to get them back. Right. Okay, good. Let's get on. The team enters the power station. The first room appears to be a security station. There's a first problem. Doors are locked. These are pretty solid too. Is that glass bulletproof? Check it. Guess that answers that. Command, are we cleared to use explosives in here? Negative. Structure is pretty weak all over. You'll risk caving yourself in. Well, shit. There's no other way in. Hang on. We have anybody on site with a level 4 clearance card? One that can override breach lockdowns? Dr. Edwards is with a team over at the containment bay. No, no, it would have to be somebody older. Edwards has only been around, like, what, 10 years? Somebody who has had the clearance for a long time. Stand by. Director Jameson is currently on assignment at Site 65. Eh, it's three hours from here. We want- No, you've got the right idea. Get Director Jameson on the phone, Command. Ask him what his clearance code was in, uh, when was Site 19 built? 1960? Stand by. Ten minutes pass. The extraneous logs have been removed. Alright. You ready? Go ahead. Well, I'll be damned. Hello, Researcher Jameson, when you look at that. We'll send the director your regards. Please do. Good work, one. Let's get in here. The team enters the power station main concourse. Can you see the damaged core? No, they all look fine. Let's switch to the thermal lens. There it is. Are you missing something? The core looks fine. We need to get closer to it, guys. Right. Releasing micro drone command. Y-242 removes a micro drone from his pack and releases it. The drone approaches the power station cores and begins to circle them. Twelve cores are accounted for, seven of them damaged beyond repair, three have not been brought up to power, and two are operating at full capacity. One of the two is the superheated core, which aside from its abnormal temperature, shows no other sign of damage. It looks fine. Can you get closer to that, Captain? Sure. The team approaches the superheated core. Temperature readings begin to rise as they get closer. It's hot enough anyway. What's this shit? It's really thick. Is that sludge? Some kind of waste? Try and avoid that, team. Captain, can you get a vial of it on the micro drone and send it back out the way you came? Yeah, hang on. Two, uh, grab one of... Yeah, you got it. Samples on the way, Command. Thanks. Be careful, guys. Try and get around to the other side of it. I'm over here. The thing looks... Ugh, fuck. Look. Jesus. Y-241's camera shows no fewer than ten human bodies bound to the side of the superheated core with wire. All of the bodies appear similarly to the bodies found by the D-12 team. Stark white, blood leaking from all orifices, non-responsive. Something written underneath them. Is that blood? What happened to Site 13? These lines don't run to the main structure. See here? They're running below us. Any kind of identifier? Let me see. Yep, yeah, they're all labeled body pit. They run straight into the ground over there. Looks like we're going below then. Command, you copy all that? We do. Just received your sample back as well. Going to get a report on that in just a few minutes. All right, good. Let's get down there. There's a stairwell over here. The team approaches the stairwell and begins to descend. These doors are all hard locked. The team descends to the bottom of the stairwell. The door there is open. This has been pried open. Looks like somebody was trying to get... Out? Not in. Something else is written on the wall here. Fuck SCP. That's polite. You smell that? Fuck. Yeah. It's disgusting. What is it? Whatever's on the other end of this hall, I'd imagine. Watch the blown radiator here, guys. Team, take note that we are losing video feed. Something's interfering with our signal here. Roger that. We Audio feed cuts out. Positioning system stays active for a few more moments as Site Command attempts to reconnect with the team. Intermittent communications are received for an additional 15 minutes. Some of these are shit. That same... It's all over the inside. That black shit smells like iron. Something crawled out. Do you hear... We need to get... 
There's a light over there. Can you see? Hello? Are you okay? Do you need help? We can Audio cuts completely. Recovery efforts are halted. No communications are received from the Y24 team for an additional 24 hours, after which the team is determined to be lost. The sample that was returned with the microdrone is revealed to be blood and power core residual runoff mixed with some kind of additional biological matter. Study into the substance is ongoing. After one week, Y241's video feed becomes active again for 13 seconds. No audio is transmitted, and the video shows a group of humans standing around and looking down at a table. One of the humans turns to look at the camera, and the video cuts. No additional communications are received from the team at any point afterward. End log. Addendum 1733, Exploration Log 6, Date. Exploration Team, Mobile Access Drone. Notes. While waiting for additional resources to arrive at SCP-1730, an unmanned ground-based drone was launched into the main site complex through the same door that the D-12 team had entered. The planned goal of this mission was to investigate lower floors and attempt to recover information relating to the origins of SCP-1730. Begin Log The drone approaches the main office building and enters through the front door. A moment is spent observing the writing on the wall in the interior lobby before moving across to the service elevator. The drone enters the elevator and turns to the floor selection. There are selections for five floors above the ground level and 15 below. The drone moves to select the B-15 level. The elevator begins to descend. After seven floors, the elevator suddenly stops. After a few moments of time, it is determined that this is due to an intermittent power failure. The drone uses a suitable utility to open the forward-facing elevator door. The open elevator shaft is visible and the drone is unable to determine the depth of the shaft. Using its winch, the drone descends below the stopped elevator to the first available floor. After prying open the door, the drone swings into the opening and retracts the winch. A sign on the wall just inside the doorway indicates that this is the 8th basement level and that it is a Euclid-class containment wing. The lights on this floor remain dark. The drone is instructed to move down the main hallway and look for a suitable area to descend to the next floor. The drone moves towards a side hallway and is instructed to explore down it. It is noted that a number of messages are written on the walls, including don't look at the walls and kill the quiet ones. After inspecting a number of rooms and finding them to only be empty offices, the drone returns to the main hallway. The drone ceases movement upon seeing a large, vaguely humanoid entity standing near the end of the hallway. This entity appears to glide slowly down the hallways, seemingly not noticing the drone. After it passes, the drone is instructed to follow the entity. The entity enters a maintenance closet near the end of the initial hallway. The drone observes as the entity extends a long arm from beneath its outer layer and touches the floor. Upon further observation, the entity is noted to have picked up some of the thick dark material, previously identified as blood and power station runoff, with what is identified as its primary finger appendage. The entity then begins to make slow movements towards the wall behind it. This is obscured from the drone's view. The entity ceases movement and then slowly turns to leave the room. The drone is instructed to move towards the wall and take note of any changes. It is noted that the entity left behind a number of unique symbols. The drone takes several flash photographs of these symbols and transmits them back to site command. The drone is then instructed to continue to follow the large entity, however the entity has disappeared from the hallway. It is noted that the entity left no apparent footprints even in the thick material covering parts of the floors. The drone is instructed to continue on regardless. The drone reaches what appears to be a series of several containment cells. The first cell is open. A placard on the side of the doorway reads Entity 324, scheduled for termination 13th of December 1975. The drone enters the doorway and observes a spacious containment cell. Thick rubber padding is all along the walls. The drone notices a human form in the corner of the room covered in the thick, dark sludge. As the drone approaches the form, small sparks fire from its fingertips towards the drone. The drone takes several photographs, then leaves. The next three cells are all empty with no placards. The fourth cell is closed, and its placard is smashed. The drone is instructed to attempt to open the door with its cutting torch, and after a few moments it is able to do so. The drone enters the room. In the corner of the room is the emaciated body of a human female, roughly aged at 34 years. 
The body shows no signs of life. A chain is seen around the neck descending into the shirt. Notable is the lack of sludge within this cell, possible as a result of the inhabitant closing the door and locking it from the interior. The drone searches the corpse for an identification badge and finds one. The name reads Jack Bright. The drone is then instructed to search the neck chain, but the chain is discovered to be broken. The drone then leaves the room. The drone traverses a short way until it finds a stairwell. The drone descends to the next floor. A sign by the doorway reads fifth floor. The drone turns to view the stairwell it had previously descended from, but finds it non-existent. After some short discussion at site command, the drone is instructed to enter the doorway. The drone enters a large spacious office floor lit by sunlight. Several terminals are nearby, though all of them appear damaged or otherwise unusable. The drone approaches the least damaged terminal and attempts to power it on. The terminal does not power on, though whether this is due to a power outage or damage to the machine is unknown. The drone maneuvers across the room. The drone reaches a terminal labelled M. Hadley, which appears mostly undamaged and attempts to power it on. The terminal powers on and the drone then attempts to connect with the computer. The computer is running the same foundation-based system as the current model, albeit a number of generations older. The drone is instructed to transmit every file it is capable of accessing to site command. The drone begins to do this. Note, at this point in the operation, site command lost contact with the drone. Several members of the operation team suddenly showed symptoms of some kind of anomalous influence, growing silent and beginning to burn from their ears. After the onset of symptoms, any sound would trigger what appeared to be a silent explosion that shook site command and destroyed most of its communicative equipment. It was later discovered that the only individuals influenced by this were those who had viewed the symbols created by the large entity in the basement storage closet. Further examination by Foundation Cognitohazard Specialists and Screening Technology ascertained that the symbols themselves were a sort of pyroclastic cognitohazard. Any individual becoming aware of the symbols would inevitably succumb to the effects of the hazard, making any additional exploration of the site hazardous. The drone was left unattended for several days thereafter, though it did complete its task of transmitting the terminal contents. Attempts to reconnect with the drone were unsuccessful, and drone surveillance of the site from outside of the building showed that all of the floors above ground level in the primary structure were entirely empty. The drone was not located. Containment Update Dangerous biological and cognitohazardous entities have resulted in high casualties of security rescue teams. Mobile Task Force Zeta-9 Mole Rats has been assigned to all current exploration efforts. Addendum 1733 Exploration Log 7 Date Exploration Team Mobile Task Force Zeta-9 Mole Rats Notes Due to high casualties sustained by previous exploration attempts, it was decided that a team experienced in exploration of anomalous structures would be called in to continue operations at SCP-1730. To that end, Mobile Task Force Zeta-9 The Mole Rats was assigned to SCP-1730. The team consisted of five explorative members and one support member who would stay at site command and monitor fluctuations in local reality. Begin log. We're online. Let us know when you've got a link, support. Coming up now. I'm loading your displays with what should be a pretty accurate map of what you should see in there, but... Don't bet on it, right? Like always, it's fully possible that there's a type green in there, alongside the other nasties. All right, Command. What's the worst of it? There is at least one cognito hazardous entity writing hazards on the walls. Your display should be able to filter out any and all messages written on the walls, so we don't take any chances. As for the rest, it's a containment site. Awesome. There you have it, guys. Load up. Let's get in there. Yes, ma'am. The team enters the main structure, but search the upper floors first. As observed by the flying drones, the floors are empty. There is no sign of the previous exploration drone. We're clean here. How are we looking, support? Holding steady, Captain. Nothing out of the ordinary. Tell Four that he needs to adjust his channel frequency. I'm having trouble connecting to that module. Will do. Four, check your frequency. You're falling out. The team descends to the main level. After ascertaining the functionality of their hazard-blocking displays, the team moves towards a descending stairwell instead of the service elevator. Going down now. Starting to see some of that sludge. Any idea where it comes from? Part of the mixture is power station runoff. 
but it's mostly blood and some other biological residue, like pus. As for where it comes from, your guess is as good as ours. Guess that's what we're here to find out. That's the one. Tighten up, Ball. We're going into the dark. The team descends several levels until they reach the sixth basement level, marked as a Euclid containment wing. The captain motions to enter the floor. A lot of bodies in here, Cap. I see him. Stay alert, guys. Copy that. Let's keep moving. The team moves forward for a short time, investigating the mostly empty floor. Suddenly, a rumbling is heard. All team members stop and wait for the noise to end. There is a crash and 9-4 shouts. So what was that? Came from below you. Notice any structural damage? Sure did. Floor collapsed under Randall. He's down below us. I, I can see him. Four, you read me? Yeah, Cap. I'm alright, but my leg is pretty fucked. I don't know if I can get up. Alright, stay there. We're gonna get down to you. Three, you stay here with Randall. One, two, move with me. Let's find a stairwell down. Captain, something fluctuating below you. You copy? The captain does not respond. Site Command also attempts to communicate with the team and fails to do so. Communications continue to be transmitted from the team. Where are they? Should be on their way. Any way you can get down here? Not without breaking my legs. You sure? I think I can hear something down here. I can't hear anything. It's probably just the pipes. The fucking pipes. From 9-4's perspective, the floor is shrouded in darkness beyond 4 meters. The only illumination is coming from the floor above. No, it's definitely something. It's... Fuck. Brad, it's slithering. There's something down here. Hang on me. Cap, you read me? Cap? One. Two. Anybody? God damn it. Brad, shit, it's right here. I can hear it. Get the fuck away from me, you slimy asshole. I said get the fuck back. Don't shoot anything, Randall. You'll... 9-4 cries out. 9-3's camera observes what appears to be a black, leech-like creature, approximately the length and width of an adult human arm, moving slowly towards 9-4. 9-4 continues to fire wildly, causing 9-3 to run behind the opening in the floor for cover. Suddenly, the gunfire stops, and 9-3 looks back over the edge. Jesus, I... The creature has now entered 9-4's open mouth and is moving slowly down his throat. 9-4's mic picks up muffled cries and a low grinding noise, like chewing. 9-3 aims his weapon at the creature and fires, missing it when 9-4 twitches. 9-3 fires again, striking 9-4 in the arm. Oh god, oh god, oh... Captain, permission to fire on Randall. God damn it, Captain. Permission to fire on 4. Oh god, Randall, I... 9-3 raises his weapon and fires at 9-4. There is another rumble and the ground beneath 9-3 gives way. 9-3 falls onto the concrete below and is crushed by additional falling debris. 9-3's camera and microphone disconnect. 9-4's microphone continues to pick up 9-4 choking and vomiting for an additional 5 minutes, after which 9-4 grows silent. Another leech creature emerges from his mouth and disappears. 9-4 stands and picks up 9-3's weapon. 9-4's camera disconnects. Notes. At this point, the Zeta-9 team was in full disconnect. Two members were assumed KIA, while the other three were not accounted for. After three hours of non-communication, Site Command contacted Overwatch Command to request a full stop to all explorative efforts into SCP-1730. While waiting for a response, 9-1's microphone came back online. You didn't look, did you? Yeah, me neither. Cap? It was over there, against that wall. Is it not there anymore? I can get it open. We need fucking bullets. I think they're gone, yeah, but I don't want to wait around for... Lower? What floor are we on right now, anyway? I thought there were only supposed to be 15. Fuck. Alright. 9-4's camera suddenly comes online, showing a massive room dimly lit by many small flames. Further observation of the footage shows that the small flames all originate from the ears of many humanoids, standing quietly around the walls. 
In the center pit is a large creature that appears to be covered in many smaller creatures. It is barely distinguishable in the low lighting. Several large pipes over the creature have been cut and are draining onto the center of the room. The camera cuts out. What happened to Site 13? This is like the fifth time. I don't fucking know how I'm... Right. Wait. Yeah, I do too. It's coming from over there. This shit is everywhere. Fuck. Look. Open that door. Shh. No, I... Shh. Stay quiet. We need to get back upstairs. Hey, who's that? 9-1's mic disconnects. Note. With the entire team once again unresponsive, Site Command ordered an emergency termination of all explorative efforts into SCP-1730 while waiting for confirmation from the O5 Council. Four hours pass with no response before the captain's camera begins transmitting. Microphone comes online shortly after. The captain is standing in a very tall room looking at some kind of large and intricate machine. She approaches the machine slowly before settling over some kind of input console with a backlit screen. The captain wipes dust off of a label just above the screen. The word fresher is clearly visible. The captain's hands hover over the keyboard at the console. Another distant sound can be heard over the microphone, later identified as footsteps. The captain turns quickly to face the darkness behind her. As she turns, her shoulder-mounted light strikes something on the machine behind her and goes out. The footsteps grow closer. The captain begins to breathe heavily and starts running through the dark. She trips and falls, and the noises begin to close in. Fuck you, get the captain's camera disconnects. No additional transmissions are received from the Zeta-9 team. Containment update. Due to the events detailed in Exploration Log 7, all future exploration of SCP-1730 has been suspended indefinitely, pending overseer approval. Addendum 1734 recovered data from the power station terminal. Dr. Hadley, as you can see, the power output to the Thresher device has been adjusted to your specifications. At your command, the reactors will surge to the full 55 gigawatts required to activate the device. Like I mentioned in our previous correspondence, the reactors will likely not survive this kind of power surge. The core dedicated to the body pit might, given its reinforced construction, but there will likely be significant damage to all the rest. Additionally, and you'll forgive me for speaking out of place since I'm not assigned to the Thresher device, but the device is still wildly unstable. The tests have been encouraging on smaller subjects, and it might someday be an applicable piece of technology, but at this moment it is only considered a measure for very final attempts. Utilization of the device could make local reality unstable here, as well as wherever the device ends up. In other words, I hope you know what you're doing. Best of luck. Addendum 1735. Collected data logs. Communication log 1. Dear Dr. Hadley, we've received your communication and thank you for taking the time to contact us. We have considered your request, but at this time we cannot approve any transfers. If you're at Site 13, you're there because of your superb level of professionalism and aptitude in your position, and we cannot afford to have you anywhere else. You may speak to your site pharmacist about an amnestic regimen if you like, but we will not allow you to transfer from Site 13. As for your concerns about Director Emerson's mortuary protocol, we understand your complaints. However, you must understand that anomalies, especially those classified as humanoid, are not human beings. Human beings fall into a very specific category of non-anomalous life forms. Humanoid anomalies may appear to be human, but are simply humanoid. As such, they are not entitled to the rights and privileges afforded to human beings by the Ethics Committee. Our job as researchers is to identify where anomalies come from and then to identify how to best utilize those anomalies for the benefit of mankind. We are protectors, and we cannot protect unless we know everything there is to know about the threat at hand. Once we have learned what we can learn, we neutralize the threat. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact our offices. Sincerely, Peter Grunwald. 
Testing Log Entity 3421 Administrator Doctor 1343 Test Purpose To identify Class 8 Entity's ability to bend reality while exposed to dangerous conditions and to a Scranton Molius inhibitor device. The use of SC to reanimate Entity between tests has been approved. Test 1 The Entity is exposed to temperatures of negative 35 degrees Celsius. Result The Entity loses energy and becomes less hostile. Extended exposure results in low external temperatures and the decay of the skin layer. The entity expires after one hour of sustained exposure. Test 2. The entity is exposed to temperatures of 150 degrees Celsius. Result. The entity quickly succumbs to heat stroke. The body shows signs of burning across all surfaces. The entity sustains catastrophic organ damage as a result of the extreme temperature. The entity is unable to change reality to save itself. Test 5. The entity is submerged in water. Result? Notes. Water seems to interfere with the Scranton Molius device. Test 13. The entity is electrocuted. Result? The entity is unable to save itself and the body is no longer salvageable. The entity has been moved to the body pit for incineration. Communication Log 2. Subject, control of hazardous toxins in the reactor core. Termination Log 1 Summary of Events The entity showed unwillingness to submit to further testing, and as such was swiftly terminated by way of electrocution. The entity was then moved to the body pit for incineration. Noting here that additional orders have come in from Director Emerson requesting a full-scale termination of the entire humanoid wing. Those will be processed at your convenience, and we can begin to empty out those floors. Sincerely, Dr. 790 Unknown Log 3 has shown some tenacity, but will soon break under the mental pressure applied to it by the orbiters. This is not uncommon. Many entities arriving for their initial inspection will resist exposure to treatment in some way, but it cannot be sustained for the duration of their time here. Entity does have a particularly interesting effect on which leads me to believe that we could repurpose that aspect of the entity by removing the face, neck, upper chest area, and arms, and applying it to a Mark 12 using the... I will send this notice to Dr. 874 post-haste and move forward with this project. Sincerely, Dr. 720. Unknown Log 12. Dr. Hadley, they took your blood leech boy down to the pit today. I made sure to alter his termination record accordingly, and made sure that output is still blocked up. I don't know what you've got planned for him, but that pit's pretty noxious now. It's not going to be good. Letter received from Dr. Hadley. Director Emerson. Before we get started, let me just say that the number thing was always bullshit. If you want to properly dehumanize your researchers, you put them in cubicles. The numbers were a joke from the beginning. If you're reading this, then you're left with a decision. What did you think was going to happen throwing the bodies of anomalies into that pit? Did you think that their being alive made them anomalous? Hell, being alive is the least anomalous part of humanity. I thought you might have seen that, but then things have changed. The containment breach was my fault. I won't lie to you. In my research, I had the pleasure of analyzing a young boy. His name was Elijah. He subsisted only on blood, and he could siphon it through others with his mouth, right through their skin, like a leech. He had no mental capacity beyond two years, and yet, he deserved the same chance to live as the rest of us. He did not choose to be the way he was. Then you decided to have him burned, like the rest of them. So I modified his record. The fires of your pit won't have incinerated him, just agitated him. And that sludge that's been building up? I'm glad you cared to get it cleaned up. I'm sure you're glad too. 
It's pretty awful down there. Anyway, your decision. The containment breach was inevitable. And whether it was something that crawled out of the pit that did it, or my hand on a button, makes no difference. You have a choice to make. Either stay your course, and certainly be devoured by the creatures you have been torturing for the last 15 years, or activate the Thrasher device and hope it dumps you in a more hospitable reality than your own. Either way, our world will be rid of you and your filth and will be better for it. This is your death camp, Elliot. You made your bed and now you get to die in it. Sincerely, Hadley. P.S. Amazing how much can change in just a few years, isn't it? All because you were chasing a promotion. Incredible. I hope it was worth it. Oh yeah, and if you decide you want to talk this out, I'll be down in the basement with Elijah. I've got a nice warm spot for him to get set up when he arrives. You made sure there will be plenty of blood. Addendum 1736 received audio transmission. The following audio transmission was picked up on monitoring equipment on the morning of the 1st of February 2016. The transmission, both speech and an encrypted signal that followed, has been repeating on a continuous loop since it was first detected. The contents of the transmission are as follows. Hello, my name is Dr. Muhammad Scott and I'm a researcher within the SCP Foundation's Site-13 Temporal Studies Division. Myself and my team were abandoned within Site-13 during a recent catastrophic event, the full details of which we still don't know. We are currently surrounded by hostile entities and other hazardous anomalies. Of the original 30 members of my team, only 12 remain. To any Foundation operatives listening on this channel, we are asking for your assistance. Our supplies are dangerously low, as is our ammunition, and without aid, it is unlikely that we will last more than another month. Following this message will be an encrypted, adjusted VMS transmission, decipherable by standard 1980s Foundation technology. The information within that transmission will contain our location, at least as well as we can describe it. The transmission is wired by dead man switch to myself, and it will be played on a continuous loop. Till such a time as I die. Please help us. Thank you. Containment update 1st of February 2016. Due to information gathered by Foundation surveillance teams, exploration and recovery efforts into Site 13 are no longer indefinitely suspended. Details will be available on a need to know basis. Assigned mobile task force units will be alerted by the superior officers. Addendum 1737 Updated Exploration Memorandum. In light of recent information gathered by Foundation surveillance teams, it has been deemed pertinent to once again send exploration and recovery teams into Site-13. By order of Overwatch Command, SCP-1730's containment procedures have been updated. Mobile Task Force Tau-5 Samsara is currently under consideration for deployment. Details to follow. Containment Update, 15th of May 2017. Mobile Task Forces Apollo 3 Game Wardens and Tau-5 Samsara are activated and assigned to exploration of SCP-1730. Addendum 1730-8 Exploration and Recovery Log Transcripts Date Exploration Team Mobile Task Force Apollo 3 Game Wardens Team Lead Ross Team Members Houston, Noah, Ohalo, Vigo Begin Log Radio's live, everybody good? Hang on. 60 seconds to insertion. Copy. Vigo, you good? Yep, I got it. We set? We're good. Alright, stay cool, keep your lights on, and if you see anything suspect, hit your visors and give everyone else the heads up. Remember, the internal topography of this place is unstable, so there's a pretty good chance we'll get separated. If we do, stay put until the place stabilizes and somebody will come pick you up. Use your broadcasters if nobody is responding, and shoot anything that moves. Unless it's one of us, probably. Then definitely shoot. <laughs> 30 seconds to insertion. Houston, you take lead. Our information suggests this entrance leads down a pretty long staircase, but there shouldn't be any other doors we encounter until we hit the bottom, so we should be more or less safe until we get there. 
Got it? Got it. Any other questions? A uh, Halo, you're quiet back there. I'm good, boss. All right, that's what I like to hear. Ten seconds to insertion. Here we go. Game wardens, you are cleared to begin operation. Let's roll. The team enters SCP-1730. As expected, the initial interior space is a long descending staircase. Houston takes the lead. Team, we're monitoring you from here, but let us know if you hear, see, or experience anything unexpected. Copy. The team descends for three minutes. The interior of SCP-1730 is unlit, with the only luminescence coming from the shoulder-mounted and weapon-mounted light of MTF AP-3. How are we looking? Pretty good. We... I see a door up here, on the landing. I see it. Alright, that's unfortunate. A halo, Noah, keep it on our backs when we pass it. The team stops at the landing. Houston tries to open the door, but it is locked. There's air blowing under the door here. See, where the dust is kicked up. Yeah. Vigo, I see that thermal camera. Alright, hang on. Here it is. Yeah. Not even going to be in to fuck with that. Let's keep going. Team lead, you copy? Is everything alright? Uh, yeah, we're good. Still descending. Affirmative. Just got some static. Wanted to make sure you were good. The team continues to descend for three more minutes. Light. Look. Yeah. Come on, there's a light up ahead. It might be our exit. Eyes open. The team descends for two minutes. Shit. Whoa. What the fuck is that? God damn it. Alright, come on, be advised that the bottom of the stairwell is just... missing. I don't know where the light we saw is coming from, but we go down about three more steps and we're in some sort of void. I don't see a bottom to it. Copy that. Hang tight, team. We're taking a look at this. What if we drop something in it? See how far down it goes. I mean, I can see how far down it goes, and it sort of looks like forever. A halo shrugs. Game wardens, go ahead and proceed back up. We'll see about another insertion point. Damn it. It's all right, we'll just- Ross, look. It's not a void, it's a liquid. It's just not reflecting light, like, at all. It's pitch black. Looks sort of like water. Hang on. Yeah, we're not going to fuck with that either. Come on, how far are we to the bottom of the stairwell? One moment. You're about 15 meters below where we expected the stairwell to end. Stella, the topography is off here. Let's head back up a ways and see if we can find a different exit. Team lead, hold position for a moment. We're trying to determine your location right now. Hey, chief. Hold on. No, look, it's... Shut up, I... Oh, crap, it's rising. Shit. All right, boys, time to go. Black liquid begins to quickly rise behind MTF AP-3. The team moves quickly up the stairwell in relative silence. It's gaining on us. Fuck, come on! There's another door up here. Hurry! Jesus Christ, I... Shit, don't... Houston! My legs! Jesus, my legs! I... Hang on! The team enters the door on the next landing. The door is slammed shut behind them. Holy Jesus, what happened to his legs? Shit. Houston, are you... I... uh... wait... What's happening? Do you read us? Yeah. Sorry, come on. That all happened quickly. Houston fell coming up the stairs and his legs got covered in that... stuff. And now they're just gone. One clean cut, like they weren't ever there. I can actually still feel them, guys. Like, I can see they're not there, but it doesn't hurt. And I think I can stand up. What the fuck? Houston proceeds to stand up. He is missing his legs from his knees down, but appears to be floating as if they were still there. Vigo waves his hand underneath Houston's legs, which passes through the space unimpeded. Uh... Alright, so there's that. You aren't hurting, Houston? Nothing feels different. Okay, that's fucking crazy. Come on, do we know anything about this? Negative. Alright, let's keep going then. Come on, it looks like we're in a maintenance hallway or something similar. We've got pipes running up and down the wall, gauges and such. It's pretty warm here. Air. On the wall. What happened to Site 13? 
It's a recurring phrase that keeps showing up written on the walls here. Come on, do we know that's not a meme? It isn't. None of the studies we ran uncovered any anomalous effects related to that phrase. We're still not sure why we keep finding it, though. Noted. Down the hall. The team continues in silence for four minutes. During this time, Noah's camera disconnects suddenly. This information was not promptly relayed to the task force. There's something up ahead, see? There, at the corner. Is that a... person? Approach with caution, safety's off. The team approaches the target in silence. Upon reaching the target, the video feed shows a severely disfigured, rotted human corpse, age unknown, partially conjoined to the wall behind it. Several other spatial distortions are evident nearby, such as the ceiling and wall appearing to pull back into each other, but this is unnoticed by AP3. <sighs> Shit. Just to see a familiar face. Guys, it's just Zachary. Thank God. Zachary, how'd you get down here? Us too, man. This place is messed up. Look at my legs, man. Look at this shit. Team lead, please be advised that you are under the effects of a powerful cognito hazard. We are attempting to upload a filter to your scramble visors. One moment. Nah, Command, it's alright. It's just Zachary. We go way back, don't we, buddy? Vigo playfully punches the corpse, dislodging its jaw. The corpse does not respond. Zachary, we're looking for some other people trapped in here. Do you know how to get to the lower levels? Shit. Okay, okay. So wait, what's below that? Uh-huh. Damn, he's right. Where's Noah? The team turns, and Noah is not seen. Oh shit. Zachary, stay here. Noah, do you read me? Noah, it's Ross. Do you hear me at all? Command, where the fuck is Noah? That's uncertain, team lead. Be advised, the upload is complete. Please restart your visors for the filter to take effect. The team restart their visors. There we go. What was it that- Oh, gross! Command, there's a body in the wall down here. Looks like it's been fused into it or something. Our visors are ticking like crazy too. Acknowledge, team lead. Proceed. Wait. Look, back there. You see shimmering? Is that gas? It looks like a gas leak. Look at the floor. Look behind it. Noah? Approaching MTF AP3 is a shimmering, transparent humanoid construct, apparently the source of the spatial anomalies in this area. As its feet touch the ground, the floor begins to warp within space around them, stabilizing after the entity passes by. Noah is visible hanging behind the entity, though the nature of the agent is uncertain, as the spatial anomaly he is caught in appears to be extremely severe, and very few of his features can be made out. Noah is seen attempting to move slightly, but continues to be twisted by the anomaly as it moves. MTF AP3 fires on the entity. As the bullets approach, their trajectory changes and they twist and spin around the entity before falling harmless on the floor or lodging in the ceiling. This isn't working, Chief. We- My fucking arm! Shit! Vigo is seen turning and attempting to pull away from an unseen force. From a Halo's camera, a long, shimmering, transparent appendage is seen stretching towards Vigo, abstracting the wall closest to it as it moves. It wraps around Vigo's left arm, which begins to visibly distort. Vigo screams. Houston, the anchor! Oh, yeah! Houston produces a miniature portable Scranton reality anchor, which he powers on and lobs towards the entity. There is a flash of red light, and for a split second, the entity becomes visible as an extremely disfigured, grotesquely elongated humanoid, which exists for only a second before the spatial distortions surrounding it are anchored and violently reset, creating a massive pressure wave in the confined space. The team is momentarily incapacitated. Oh! Vigo's left arm is bright red, but otherwise unscathed. Ohalo assesses it. The color will go away. That's just the anchor cooling down. You good? Yeah, I'm alright. Thanks. Jesus. Noah? Noah, are you there? Can any of you see Noah? Ross, here, look. In the wall. As the dust clears, Noah becomes visible, partially fused with the wall, ceiling and floor, across 10 meters of hallway. The agent is unmoving. <laughs> God! Oh. Come on, do you read me? Hello? 
We read you, team lead. We've, we've lost Noah. He's in the wall. Do you want us to proceed? One moment. Team lead, do you feel as if returning to the surface will be more dangerous to continue your mission? I... I have no way of knowing that. We have no way of knowing what's in here. Everything in here is so... fucked, it's incredible. I don't even know if we can get back if we wanted to. None of the other teams have, have they? That is correct. Honestly, whatever happens down here can't be any worse than whatever we'd see on our way back. It probably doesn't make a difference. Whatever, let's keep going. Affirmative, team lead. We are preparing another team to evac you, in the event that you reach your target. Insertion time is in four hours. You're sending another task force in here? What idiots volunteered for that gig? Samsara. Oh. Alright, cool, I copy. The team continues on for a short time unimpeded. They pass through several other areas including a ransacked infirmary, a cafeteria space melted into slag, and a wing of containment units identified as Olympia class that are no less than 100 meters in height. Eventually, the team enters a room off of the main hallway that appears to be a telecommunication center. A single television is illuminated on a wall across from them. This is weird. Stay cool, guys. Search this room, see if there's anything we can collect that they could use topside. These terminals have power. I'll collect the backup. There is a sound on the other end of the room, like static. A Halo and Houston move towards the illuminated television. Is something broadcasting through this? The screen flickers and an image appears. The interior of a standard containment cell is shown, though it is devoid of any comforts or belongings. A single red light behind the camera is on, poorly illuminating the space. A long figure is huddled in the corner. Hang on, is that... Holy shit, it is. What is it? It's Bobble the goddamn clown. At the mention of the name, the figure in the corner looks towards the camera. What? What do you want? Who is it? Jesus, uh, my name is Ephraim Ross. I'm, I'm an agent with the... Actually, hang on. Who are you? The figure shifts sideways and more of its body becomes visible through the darkness. The red light illuminates its eyes, though little else of the figure can be made out. Mm. You are different. You smell different. You know I can smell you. Even from here. You don't know that though. They did. But you're not like them. They went to great lengths to figure that out. That they knew. They know. They will know. <laughs> You're Bobble the Clown, yeah? The figure slides slowly across the wall of the cell, just out of range of the red light. Its movements are noticeably erratic. It comes closer to the camera. They had a number for me once when I was Bobble. But your friends didn't like the number said we identified with the numbers. <laughs> I am not Bubble, but I am a thing that used to be Bubble. You're not where you're supposed to be, gun buddy. You don't match the air in here. You're out of place, just like I am, just like we are. Uh -huh. What happened here? Daddy Emerson played a tricky little game with the strings of the universe. He walked on them like a tightrope and was surprised when he fell. Tricky little Emerson. Didn't just want boxes, no, no, no. He wanted boxes full of ideas, ideas like pain, horror, and death. He worked very hard to stack those boxes on his string and broke the whole thing and we all came tumbling down with him. <laughs> How many other entities are in here? What else do you know? How many? <laughs> How many entities were swallowed by Site 13? <laughs> you silly, silly out of place boy, silly little boy. Everything made its way into Site-13. 
If the Foundation could find it and the Coalition could catch it, it was fed into the meat grinder down here. Everything. They mulched us all if there was nothing to gain. Some got lucky. Bobble got lucky. Stuffed in a funny box, played with, toyed with, experimented with, to see what sounds we made when we wanted to die. Others were not so lucky. They burned the library, you know. Held it upside down like a can of soup. And let the contents run out into the furnace. And burned the whole place up. They did other things, too. Worse things. Daddy Emerson liked it. He watched it all every time. Got his jollies off watching it. <laughs> what worse things? The figure approaches the camera and comes fully into view, illuminated by the red light. A significant portion of its body is distorted by video static that moves as it moves. This static appears to be cutting into the tissue of the figure's body, creating large lacerations that ooze a dark yellow fluid. As it moves, the figure appears to be sloughing off large portions of its mass, which are replaced with static. Half of its face sloughs off as it nears the camera, and one eye becomes shrouded in static. Every worse thing. Chief, we're picking something up on the radio. I think it's a survivor's signal. We must be getting close. All right, let's keep moving. Have fun, boys. Don't let the dead bugs bite. <laughs> If you see Daddy Emerson down there, rape him to death for me. The AP3 team passes out of the telecommunications room and into the main hallway. Following the strength of the signal discovered by Vigo, they near an area that appears to be a cryogenic containment unit, similar to those utilized in the defunct cryogenics Y-Wing of Site-19. As they pass through this area, Command loses the signal of each member of the team with only intermittent static being broadcast. This continues for 30 minutes before a signal is received again. Command? Command, are you there? Do you read me? Houston, we read you. Are you all right? Is everyone all right? Oh, damn, thank God. We've been trying to reach you forever. Yeah, we found the survivors. They're holed up down here in... Uh, I... Don't know what you call this place, but it's not conducive to habitation. We're looking at 20, maybe 30 people. We found some other agents of ours too. A few mole rats and a guy from the Travelers. They all ended up down here. Are you prepared to evac? Uh, yes. So, that's not going to happen the way I think we wanted to. Not currently. It's a whole lot worse here than we had anticipated command. I don't know how they ever locked some of this stuff up, but suffice to say that every single containment cell is broken open. And this is real. Like, really real. We keep hearing things down the hallways nearby. I think whatever is out there is looking for us. I think they're angry. If they find us, we don't have the bullets to keep them down. Let alone get these people out. Where is Ross? He's been trying to get some defenses ready with the others, in case they come tonight. It's not looking good, you know? I don't know if you guys have a backup plan, but we'll take any ideas. How long have you been down there? Uh... Maybe three days? Affirmative. Apollo 3 team. Be advised that we are activating and inserting Tau-5 for rescue and recovery. Hell yes. Tell them to hurry. Addendum 1738. Extraction Recovery Video Log Transcript. Date. Exploration Team, Mobile Task Force Tau-5, Samsara. Team Lead, Irantu. Team Members, Munru, Onru, Nanku. The following is a transcript of an extraction and recovery mission carried out by the members of Mobile Task Force Tau-5 Samsara after contact by MTF AP-3 Game Wardens with human survivors within SCP-1730. The AP-3 team had requested assistance in extracting the survivors due to the large number of hostile entities within the site. 
Each member of MTF Tau-5 was outfitted with a number of cybernetic enhancements per the specifications of their design, including arm-mounted incendiary cannons, shock-absorbing leg extensions, heat-resistant plating, built-in scramble adaptations within the eyes, and others. Tau-5's insertion point was a drainage gate near the secondary entrance that the AP-3 team had inserted through. Begin log. We're plugged in. Site Command, do you read me? We do. You are 30 seconds to insertion. So, how dangerous should this mission be considered? Not a single person they've sent in has come out yet. Considerably. Acknowledged. This should be engaging. Team, check your optics. The last thing we need is somebody succumbing to mimetic hazard. Understood. I'm good. Also good. I'm good. Good. Remember, all we're looking to do here is extract the survivors. We're not attempting to contain anything, so if you see something nasty, put it down. As always. I don't need to be convinced. Tau 5, you are clear to begin extraction and recovery. Let's go. The T5 team enters SCP-1730 for a drainage gate under the secondary office structure. Each team member activates their shoulder-mounted lamp illuminating the tunnel. After a short time, the team reaches another gate. Several large drainage pipes are visible behind the gate. Look, up against the gate. Bodies. No fewer than 20 charred humanoid forms in varying stages of destruction are pushed up against the bottom of the gate. Several arms are pushed through the gate and are reaching out towards the tunnel. These look very burned. Where do you think they came from? Hard to say. I can't imagine they would have made it far in this condition. There's an incinerator near here, right? Near that body pit we keep hearing about? Maybe they came from there. An incinerator? As good a place to start as any. Let's get into those pipes there. The T5 team cuts through the gate and scales the wall behind it to the largest of three drainage pipes. Team continues on for a short time. The temperature is rising. I noticed it as well. We must be getting close. We're descending right now too. This is strange. Shouldn't a drainage pipe run out, not in? Maybe. Maybe it's affected by the topographical abnormalities. Likely. You're on to the wall is weak here. I can hear echoing on the other side of it. What's over there? Hang on. A hallway, I think. I see. All right. We'll split up here. Munro, you and Nanku see where this tunnel lets out. Onru and I will go through this wall and see what's on the other side. And if we get killed? Don't get killed. Understood. The T5 team splits up, with Nanku and Munru following the drainage pipe towards the source of the heat, and Irantu and Onru going through the thin wall to the hallway beyond. Irantu and Onru manage to break down the concrete wall between the drainage pipe and the hallway beyond. Within the hallway are several bare offices, barely lit by dim overhead lights. The entire area appears to have been abandoned for some time. Irantu and Onru look for an elevator or stair access but find nothing. After a short time, Onru finds a door that opens into a control room. A large glass observation window is obscured by some dark material. Many of the controls in this room have been destroyed. This is the control room for the incinerator, see? It says incinerator number one over there. And below it, it says body pit access below. I've never heard of a furnace that needs its own control room. What's blocking the windows there? Blast shields? No. No. These are bodies and garbage refuse congealed and coagulated look you can see their faces i see our intel said that one of the engineers had blocked up the drainage pipes out of here nanku and monroe are probably going to run into that i wonder if there's another way down from here i thought we'd be able to go down through the incinerator hang on onru proceeds to look over the controls on a relatively undamaged controller near the observation window as she does Nanku and Munru appear at the door. It's blocked. Something has turned the end of that pipe into slag. We tried to punch through it, but it's pretty thick. I broke my hand on it. Look. Nanku holds up her hand, which is undamaged. 
Wait, it was broken, I mean. Quiet. Henri is onto something. Got it. Henri throws a large switch and turns several nearby knobs. There is an immense groaning sound and the mass in front of the window begins to spin slowly. Interesting. There is a jolt as if something had broken free and the mass begins to spin rapidly and slowly descend. There is the distinct sound of a turbine spooling up. The team's internal temperature gauges begin to register a steady increase in heat. It's dropping. Look down there. See? The mass has cleared the window revealing a massive cylindrical chamber on the other side at least 300 meters in diameter and roughly 400 meters deep. At the center of the chamber is a massive shaft extending the full height of the chamber, attached to several large turbines. As the turbines spin, the matter within the chamber is turned into a slurry. Near the top of the chamber are several pilot lights. Large holes are present around the outside of the chamber. All right, and then? Onru throws another switch and the pilot lights are ignited. Enormous streaks of fire cascade down the ceiling of the chamber, scorching the mass below. Additional jets of flame begin to emit from the walls of the chamber. Look, down near the bottom, there's a sluice gate that looks like it's leading away from here. Over there, see? Can you get that door open? Yes, got it. A large circular door opens near the bottom of the pit, above the level of the matter within. Excellent. Though I still don't know how you think we're going to get in there, the pipe is blocked. Nanko extends her arm and fires several rounds from a wrist-mounted projectile weapon at the glass window in front of them. The glass cracks and shatters, exposing the room around them to the heat of the chamber. Straightforward. One does what one can. The team enters the incinerator and jumps down onto a ledge below, near another drainage pipe. They make their way through the vast chamber, avoiding the spinning blades and ever-descending biological slurry around them. Something unpleasant took place here. Oh? Yes, in fact. All of this has to be draining somewhere, likely out below us, through one of these fissures. We don't have time to find out. We'll follow this pipe down and see where it goes. The team enters the open door and descends down the drainage pipe a short distance before it empties into a large cistern. The team enters the cistern, which is lit from above by a large glowing plant-like structure. Interesting. What do you think that is? I... I don't know. At the sound of their voices, the glowing structure begins to shake slowly, and thousands of glowing spinning pods are released from its body. As they fall, they brightly illuminate the entire chamber. Look, the shadows. The glowing pods create vaguely humanoid shadows on the walls of the cistern, which act in an anomalous manner. These shadows appear to reach their hands up or forward, as if towards the team. As the pods reach the slurry below, they extinguish and the shadows disappear. All right, which way do we go? This is a drainage pipe, leading away from the incinerator. The incinerator is underneath the power station, which is to the east of the compound. So far as we can tell, we need to go northwest from there, so... Hang on. Look over there. At what? At the wall. Something is seeping through it. Was that there before? No. What is it? Drainage? Unlikely. It's probably runoff from the reactor or- No, it's blood. It's leeches. What? Look. Onru points at a spot on the wall, illuminated by their shoulder-mounted lamps. At that spot, a thick flow of fluid is seeping between a crack in the wall, and something small is wriggling within the crack. The team zooms in on the spot, revealing a small, arriving leech pushing its way through the spot. It breaks through and falls to the ground. Huh. It's a leech. What does that mean? Nothing good. The small leech moves towards the biological slurry at their feet, and begins to ingest it. As it does, the leech slowly begins to grow in size. More of them, in the wall, there, pushing through. The team looks back towards the wall where several spouts of black fluid are beginning to pour through various cracks along its surface. Several smaller leeches are squirming through these cracks. Onru, what do you see? There's something below us. It's huge, covered in other people's blood reaching up toward us. These are like fingers, they all communicate back to the host, then... Bring me a leech. What? You're kidding. 
No, bring me one. They're telepathic, they're communicating that way. I need a leech. Irantu moves across the room before grabbing a leech off of the ground. As he pulls it away from the liquid, it struggles and squirms, biting several large chunks out of his hand. Peculiar. Here. All right, one moment. Onru extends her left hand towards the leech, which opens up to reveal a series of long, delicate metallic rods with pointed tips. She maneuvers the rods into the flesh of the creature near the base of the brain. There, let's see. They heard the incinerator activate. They're hungry. They're coming up here to eat, a lot of them. The host is down below us, but I can't see that far down. If I look at the neural activity of the entire network of entities, I can map out the area they're in. Let me see if I can do something with that. There we go. You should all have it on your retinas now. Clever. So we're looking at a map? It seems too distorted to be a map. Ongoing topographical changes means that despite the changes in the structure of the site, it's all still located within our local reality. It's just unstable. Do we know where this Thresher device is? Probably something to do with this section here. If you follow a logical structural design plan based on the evidence provided in this map, there should be a whole extra wing here. But there aren't any of the leeches down that way. Yes, I can see conduit running to that area. That's where the Thresher machine is. What about our recovery? This area, here. Several corridors lead to a large research wing, but most of them have been blocked off. Every now and then, one of the ends of the network goes dark here. The survivors are in there. What's the fastest way in from where we're at now? One moment. Three paths to choose from, each with different potential hazards. The first takes us farther down this pipeline, until we reach a waste treatment facility within the plant. This is the longest route, but from that facility it's a fairly direct shot toward the survivors. The second path drops us into another cistern below this, which leads directly to this large chamber here. The leech is in there. I can hear it right now, it's wondering why this one hasn't come back. And the third? The third route takes us through this area here, which is... queer. I can hear the leeches as they move around the site, they're noisy, uncoordinated, acting on impulse and without much finesse. But this area, they're all very quiet. They go in and out for something, but they do it very, very quietly. Look at this leech. It's the size of a cat already. Are there any other entities in there? I can't tell. The leeches follow a single path in and a single path out. They don't stray away from it and... They don't look around. Which is the fastest path? The last one is the fastest. We follow this tunnel toward a service door and follow a staircase toward the bottom. Once we're there, there's another hallway off to the left that takes us past that area, or through it, maybe. And on the other side is the back entrance to our research wing. All right. That's the one we'll take, then. A shame. Here I thought we'd be shooting leeches. You'll have plenty of chances to on our way out, I'm sure. We need to get these people out quickly. Onru, does it feel to you like the leeches are trying to get into the wing where the survivors are? Yes, there is plenty of blood in this site, but not all of it is still warm. They'll be coming for them soon. The team leaves the cistern and follows the drainage pipe west. Eventually, the team reaches a service door lit by a single flickering lamp. There's something written on this door. Blood. Here on the wall, too. Look, what's it written in? Wait. Look. Onru amplifies her shoulder-mounted spotlight, illuminating the entire wall of the tunnel. The word blood is repeated over and over, scrawled across the surface of the wall in a thick black substance. Onru turns left, illuminating several desiccated corpses in a corner at the end of the tunnel, all of which are covered in and seeping the same fluid. Unsettling. Come on, don't waste time. The team enters the service door revealing a partial staircase. The stairs above them are intact, but the stairs below them have been destroyed. The walls of the staircase are coated in cracks, through which seeps the black fluid. Munru lights a flare and drops it, and the team watches it fall. After a short time, the flare lands with a slight splash revealing the floor below. How large is this site? Site 19 has at least 50 underground floors and no fewer than 80 individual wings. Considering what we know about Site 13, it's likely that there are at least twice as many of each, if not more. The Euclid-class containment cells alone are as large as the entirety of Site-81. 
which means there could be worse things down there nobody has seen yet. It's almost a certainty. Irantu leaps from the landing and lands near the flare, his implants absorbing the majority of the impact. The rest of the team follows suit. At the bottom of the stairwell is another door into a hallway and the team enters it. Where to now? About 200 meters down this hallway on the right. There are several security doors, but I think they've all been disabled. Through there is... I think it's a data storage center. It's big, lined with vents that lead to the cooling towers at the surface. Where do the leeches start acting strange? In there. Wonderful. The team moves down the hallway, Danku at point, flanked by Onru and Munru, and Irantu watching the rear. As they pass, they check each door to see if they are locked. Most doors lead to network maintenance areas, though notably, one door leads to the telecommunications room previously visited by the AP3 team. One screen on the far wall appears to have been busted from the inside out. Look here. This is the door to the server area. What's that door there? It's marked as Stairs to Cryonics. If I had to guess, I'd say it probably goes up to the next levels. And it's seated right on top of this room. Acts as insulation for the data center. Can we go through it? Which way is faster, Onru? The only way I can see is through the server room. There aren't any leeches up there. That is very strange. There are certainly plenty of access points to that room. Very strange. Through the server room, then. Come on. The team enters through the door of the server room. They pass through several more security doors, all of which are unlocked. As they do so, the external temperature drops severely and stays steady at roughly negative 20 degrees Celsius. Irantu motions for the team to activate their internal heating coils protecting their internal organs from damage due to exposure. As the team proceeds down the hallway into the server room, Nanku's scramble optical implant begins to activate signaling that an anomalous meme is being filtered out. However, Nanku had previously disabled the visual cue for the warning on her optical overlay, instead relying on the audio cue that accompanied the implant. The audio warning does not trigger at all. It is not until the team enter the primary server room that Onru realizes that no sound is audible at all, regardless of the source. Thinking at first that it might be her auditory implant, Onru removes the implant and restarts it but after establishing that it is functioning properly, she attempts to communicate this with Irantu. Irantu motions for the team to hold, and attempt to discern the source of the anomalous influence. As they do, each other team member receives the warning that their scramble filters are being triggered. Munru motions towards the door they entered through, but Irantu motions towards the back of the server area towards the research wing. It is during this silent discussion that Nanku first notices movement across the large room, motioning for her teammates to stay still. Each team member begins to hear a quiet whining sound, which slowly grows in intensity. As they huddle up, Munru notices writing on one of the server racks written in black fluid that says, silence, and then don't look. He motions towards the racks and the team acknowledges it. Irantu motions for the team to move towards the far wall, and they slowly proceed between the server racks towards the back exit. Suddenly, Onru catches a momentary glimpse of a large entity across the room and stops her teammates from advancing. She looks around the corner and sees the entity again as it comes back into view. The entity is a massive multi-limbed figure. The primary structure of the entity is a floating cross-legged humanoid construct with six legs, 18 arms, and 36 forearms attached to 72 hands. Each limb moves independently, gesturing and posing in constant, sudden, jerking movements. The entity does not have a head, but instead has a large, flat, circular structure attached to its upper chest that is covered in a large number of symbols and glyphs, which glow with bright white light against the entity's dark grey-brown skin. On each of the entity's arms are a gold band attached to a chain, which drags the ground when not being pulled around in one of the entity's gestures. The golden bands are etched with glyphs later identified as being powerful anti kineto hazards, though the chains are broken and the anti kineto hazards are inactive. Most notably, a single severely emaciated, severely charred human figure is bound to the flat circular structure of the entity's head. The figure twists against its restraint and appears to be screaming, likely the whining sound heard through the entity's muting kineto hazard. As the entity performs its gestures, the glyphs on its head illuminate rapidly, often causing burns where the human skin comes in contact with them. 
creating further distress and increasing the volume of the whining. Onru also notices that some aspect of the entity is creating a severe malfunction in her optical implants, singeing the circuits responsible for handling the scrabble calculations. She looks away ejecting the implants before they damage her retinas, and motions for the rest of Tau-5 team to not look at the entity directly. The team acknowledges and they continue to move forward. Suddenly, the whining becomes dramatically louder and begins to draw closer to the team. Munru drops a proximity mine from his pack and then another a short distance away. As they flee away from the entity, streaks of blue electricity begin to arc between the server racks, and the ground beneath them begins to shift as if it was made of sand. As Nanku threatens to fall into the ground, there is a muffled wave of pressure behind them as the first proximity mine detonates and the ground solidifies. The team turns a corner and the back entrance to the room comes into view. From above them, they can see a hole in the ceiling exposed to the cryonics laboratory, and briefly a complicated containment cell is visible, though it is thoroughly destroyed. The team moves swiftly towards the door as Whitehawk glyphs begin to appear on the ground beneath them and in the air around them. The team manages to duck and weave through the symbols, but Nanku catches her left arm on a glyph in the air and it bursts into flames. Irantu, having seen this from his position behind Nanku, fires his weapon at her shoulder, removing the arm. It falls to the ground and explodes into a cinder. Munru reaches the door first and throws it open, and Onru follows immediately afterwards. Nanku stumbles through, collapsing on the other side, and Irantu comes up last. Just before closing the door, Irantu turns to look at the entity closing in behind them, which at this point was a barely visible blur of gestures, fiery glyphs, and an inhuman whine. As the door swings closed, Irantu zooms in on the humanoid figure strapped to the entity's head, enough to see the word Emerson seared into the flesh of the figure. Irantu slams the door closed and immediately ejects his optical implants. The team rushes down the corridor away from the security door, and slowly the sound of footsteps can be heard around them. They reach a large open space in between several hallways and stop to catch their breath. I... I don't believe I know how to respond to whatever that was. What was that? I have no idea. I've never seen anything like it. There was a human strapped to its head. Did you see that? I did. I think it was shouting. Nanku looks at the stump of her arm. I'll likely miss that arm later. You'll be alright. Just be careful. <laughs> like I needed it anyway. I've got another. Noted. Everybody alright? No worse for wear. I'm fine. I'm alright too. We're here, look. The team turns to see the hallway to their immediate east, which has been barricaded and filled with a substantial amount of explosives and incendiary equipment. Good. Irantu approaches the barricade. Hello? This is Tau 5 Irantu. Is anyone there? We're here to get you out. Hello? Maybe we're too late. We're not too late. Hello? Is anyone there? Can you- There is a shuffling sound, and a large wooden crate is moved slightly. A dark face can be seen in the space between the crate and the wall. Captain. Oh boy, the goddamn Power Rangers. They told me about you. <laughs> you look like you've been hit by a train. Something like that. Well, come on then. We don't have much time left. The team moves towards the opening in the crates. As Munro and Nanku pass through, Onru pauses. Irantu notices this and turns to look. Irantu, look. Leeches. Black cracks have begun to form on the walls of the atrium behind them, and wriggling black leeches start to fall out of them accompanied by a thick black fluid. Addendum 1739, Extraction and Recovery Log Transcripts. Date? Team, Mobile Task Force Tau-5 Samsara, Apollo 3 Game Wardens, Zeta-9 Mole Rats. Team Lead, Irantu, Hollis, and Ross. Team members, Munru, Onru, Nanku, Houston, Vigo, Ahalo, Morris, and Willow. Notes. The following is a transcript of an extraction and recovery mission carried out by the members of Mobile Task Force Samsara after having made contact with surviving members of MTF Apollo 3 and MTF Zeta 9. Aside from the members of the Mobile Task Forces, the team was tasked with recovering 27 surviving members of Site 13 staff including Dr. Mohamed Scott, a Site 13 Assistant Director of Temporal Studies. Several of these individuals have sustained significant injuries, further increasing the difficulty of extraction efforts. Members of Mobile Task Force Alpha 20 Holy Divers were stationed above ground and were prepared to move in to aid in extraction efforts once the recovery team had escaped the lower levels of the site. 
Begin log. Mike's on. Are we really worried about recording all of this? Hey, Vigo, shut the fuck up. Do what he says. Your lead, Power Ranger. Thank you. Onru has prepared an evacuation plan. I will let her explain it. Our entry routes are here and here. The largest obstacles we are currently experiencing are the spatial instabilities within the lower levels of the site. On the suggestion of Dr. Scott and Captain Hollis, our route will first travel to this section of the facility where the Thresher device is contained. This device is the cause of the... instabilities. And, while it is not possible to completely disable the device without risking our own lives or the lives of above-ground personnel, we should be able to reduce power to the device long enough for us to create a stable path to the surface following this route here. I got lost once shortly after our insertion and ended up in that room. I was attacked by a number of creatures that were difficult to perceive, likely due to some latent anti-memetic effects. I was able to escape them, but they're no doubt still there. That machine draws a frankly impossible amount of energy from some energy source elsewhere in the site, and those creatures I saw feed off of it. So, there's that. Why don't we send a team ahead to disable the machine and then meet up with it before heading up? We do not have enough time, and the probability of our success drops dramatically if we split up our team. Once the device is powered down, it is likely that we will have less than an hour to make our escape before it trips the failsafe and powers back up again. We will just have to make our push from there, hoping that it buys us enough time. Alright, cool. Your assignments are as follows. Tau 5 will take point. Apollo 3 will take the right and left flanks. And Zeta 9 will take up the rear. The healthiest survivors will stay near the back, and those with more serious injuries will be near the front, near Tau 5. In the event that we are flanked or assaulted, follow typical multi-force defensive assignments while allowing Tau-5 to intercept higher threats. Maintain clear lines of communication. Tau-5 and the task force captains have channel priority. Keep chatter to a minimum. You will all have plenty of time to speak once we reach the surface. Our priority now is extracting these people and staying alive. Unless you're in Samsara, in which case I guess you guys are free to do what you want. For the rest of us mortals, it doesn't help us to let the Power Rangers get mulched, since we're likely shit out of luck if they go belly up. Agreed. Does everyone understand our mission? All the task force members are in agreement. Acceptable. I will take point. We need to move quickly. Gather your things, prepare the civilians, and we'll leave shortly. The teams break to assemble in their formations. The civilian survivors are briefed on the mission plan and positioned in the middle of the block. Captain, at the main door. There are leeches coming under it. Shit. Urantu, we need to roll. Agreed. Let's move out. Munru, Nanku, collapse the main door. We will exit expediently up the side. Gladly. The block moves out of the side door towards the side hallway. Nanku and Munru hang back to set explosive charges around the doorframe. Leeches are beginning to work their way under the doorframe and through cracks in the walls. As they step away from the door, Nanku opens her flamethrower on the leeches. I cannot say that you are making a difference, Nanku. There are likely many more leeches elsewhere. This is very satisfying to me. It is delicious. Munru and Nanku move quickly to join the rest of the group, which has begun moving down the side hallway. As they pass through the first door, there is an explosion and the building around them shakes. From beneath the group, a loud, uncanny screaming sound is heard. You think they know we're moving? Undoubtedly. The group continues down a series of hallways towards the stairwell, stopping occasionally to check for hostile entities. After a short time, Munru calls a halt. My optics are pinging. Strange. Move everyone back. I will scout ahead. Munru comes around the corner of the hallway, weapon drawn. His scramble optical implant highlights a dangerous meme on the wall. At the far end of the hallway, a vaguely humanoid entity, the same entity as seen during a previous remote drone exploration of SCP-1730, is seen drawing on a wall with a long curved finger. Munru projects an image of the entity to Nanku, who rounds the corner behind Munru. Hold. Suddenly, the entity turns towards Munru and Nanku and opens a single white eye, 
which is immediately processed and blocked by the scramble units. The entity begins to move very quickly down the hallway, changing dramatically as it moves. The entity becomes considerably larger, and its long robes flare out to either side, exposing additional hazards that are blocked by the scramble units. Munru and Nanku raise their weapons and fire. The creature reels backwards as it is struck by bullets, with large holes opening across its flesh. Munru reloads, loading incendiary rounds and fires again, setting the creature on fire. As it staggers backwards, the entity begins to scratch madly against the wall to the right, seemingly attempting to dig through the wall away from the gunfire. Nanku takes one more shot, striking the entity in its eye and causing it to collapse onto the ground. Is everything all right? It appears so. We- Suddenly, the hallway shakes violently. The floor beneath the collapsed humanoid entity crumbles and falls away, revealing a large hole beneath the floor. Within the hole is a long, slick black creature covered in blood-red eyes with a mouthful of many rows of long, sharp teeth. As it bursts through the floor, a cascade of small leeches are propelled into the hallway. The humanoid entity slips through the destroyed floor and falls into the mouth of the large creature, which lets out a loud scream as it devours the entity. Long, wet appendages snake into the hallway as Nanku and Munru begin to retreat. Nanku opens her flame for her again, warding off the approaching smaller leeches. What's going on? We'll need to find a different route. Quickly. Follow me. The group moves past the collapsed hallway as Munru and Nanku provide cover fire. They pass through a custodial dormitory and enter into a maintenance area behind it. Over there. We can take this path towards the machine. We are right behind you, but I am beginning to think this creature is far larger than we anticipated. En route, take the point. We'll move now. The group follows the hallways into a maintenance warehouse. They exit through a pair of doors leading into a staff break room. The group has to briefly stop to bandage up a survivor whose wound has begun bleeding again. A loud screeching sound is heard nearby. Irantu, we can't stay here long. One moment. Monru, Nanku, how far back are you? Monru, Nanku, please report. Irantu, Nanku is damaged. We are not going to be able to rendezvous with you immediately. Anru, do keep us updated on your position, and I will let you know when we can regroup. Understood. The group enter another hallway leading in the direction of the fresher wing. As they move through the hall, Anru hears a distinct sound. They're onto wings. How many? Many. More than I can count. They're very small, but there is a great multitude of them. Got anything else useful, Power Girl? A tinkling sound. Like crystal on crystal. Fuck. Crystal butterflies, it has to be. We'll get shredded. Unlikely. The group moves towards the sound, which continues to grow louder until it becomes a cacophonous sound that seems to be right above them. God, where's that coming from? Steady now. Steady. You're onto the vent. In front of them, a grate on a ceiling vent falls open, and a cloud of sparkling crystal butterflies begins to fill the hallway. Irantu sees the butterflies and turns back to the group. Everybody down, please. As the group drops to the ground, Irantu runs towards the cloud of butterflies. He disappears briefly. After a short moment, there is a burst of flame that moves upwards into the vent, and the sound of shattering crystal can be heard above them. As the smoke clears, Irantu becomes visible again. The majority of his flesh has been shredded by the wings of the butterflies, and his entire body is scorched. Significant amounts of flesh hang loose from his body. The skin on his back is blackened and blistered, and a thick metal implement is now visible through the scorched flesh. Onru stands and approaches him. Are you able to continue? Of course. Jesus Christ, man! Are you alright? Yes. Why wouldn't I be? The group moves through another hall seeping with black fluid, and then another, but the third hallway is clean and relatively untouched. They ascend a short staircase before coming to a stop before a thick vault door. The machine is behind this door. I came out this way, but the door sealed behind me. I don't know how to unlock it. Dr. Scott, do you know how to open this door? No. I never had access to this chamber. I was hoping Monroe would be here. I do not think I can open this door. Suddenly, there is a resounding click and the door in front of them slowly opens. A monitor next to the door illuminates and a dark room is visible on it. In the back of the room, 
hidden in shadows, an indistinct humanoid entity waves. A harsh electronic static sound vaguely reminiscent of laughter can be heard through an unseen loudspeaker. Ah, you're welcome. Oh, oh, Tanny, oh Tanny. It's so long down here with us. It's so long and sharp, Tanny. Why did you make me hurt? Oh. That's a pretty fucked up clown. Come, hurry. The group enters the chamber beyond. The room is very dark, with a multitude of dim green lights visible on the walls of the room. Based on the luminescence of the lights and the apparent distance of them from each other, the room appears to be several hundred meters in diameter. Near the back of the room, a tower of circling green lights is visible. Hey Power Rangers, can you see anything in here? You have dark vision or something, yeah? My visor is shot. Onru and I were forced to eject our implants after they were damaged by a powerful memetic entity. My advisor works, hang on. Alright, so... There's a... some kind of machine near the back of the room under those lights. I can't really make any of it out from here, but it's there. I don't see... Oh... Shit, yeah I do. On the ceiling there are... <laughs> fuck. There are a lot of those things. What are they? I honestly don't. I can't make them out. They're definitely fucking with perception. I don't think they've seen us. Seriously though, there, there might be 500 of these things. That would be more than Onru and myself can deal with. We need to make a decision. Either attempt to disable the machine without attracting their attention, or find a way to dispatch the creatures. I am, of course, willing to accept ideas. I mean, we could blow them up. Houston has explosives. That's a lot of them to try and get all at once, though. Maybe. But it's more likely that- Suddenly there is a massive disturbance beneath the chamber. To the left of a group, roughly a hundred meters away, there is an explosion and the wall falls away. From within the wall emerges a long, slick, black appendage covered in red eyes. The eyes open simultaneously. There is a screeching sound and from above the many hundreds of short, imperceptible entities fall from the ceiling. The black entity in the wall begins to lash out at the smaller entities, attempting to pull them in towards a mouth that has appeared on its front. The creatures fly towards the larger creature and begin to tear at it with claws, though many are shoveled into the open mouth of the creature. Huh. That works as well. En route get to the machine. The rest of you, get back to the hallway. We'll not have much time. The group retreats into the hallway outside of the large room. Onru sprints across the chamber as more and more of the smaller entities fall from the ceiling and attack the black creature. Several of them begin to move towards Onru, only to be dispatched by weapon fire from Irantu. As she reaches the manual control panel of the machine, Onru inputs the information provided to her by members of Dr. Scott's team. Lights around the room illuminate, exposing an enormous, vastly complicated machine that encompasses the entire back wall of the room. More and more of the hostile entities peel off towards Onru, who pauses to open fire on those who come too close. From beneath the room there is another disturbance and the floor in the middle of the room falls away. Another long black entity emerges from the hole in the floor and long tendrils snake out towards Onru. From behind Irantu comes gunfire and the entire AP3 team has emerged from the door and begun firing at the entity. The creature recoils, black fluid spilling from gunshot wounds. The tendrils whip around towards them, gripping Vigo and tossing him into the air. He strikes the wall and his body falls to the ground, where the first black entity grabs it with a tendril and pulls it into the mouth. Suddenly, small black leeches begin to pour from the hole in the floor and move quickly towards Irantu. Houston and a halo open fire on the leeches, and Ross moves to pull Irantu away from the hole. As he does, he tosses an incendiary grenade into the hole and pulls Irantu to the ground. There is an explosion, and flame erupts around the black entity which rears back and flails before collapsing into the hole. From deep below them the group can hear a very loud screaming sound, and suddenly the entire room is shaking. The other black entity retracts into the hole, collapsing the wall behind it as it does. The remaining creatures from the ceiling are dispatched by the AP-3 and Zeta-9 teams. As they do, and as the room begins to shake more violently, several lights affixed to the machine in the back begin to flash and then dim and the sound of something winding down is heard over the gunfire. Fuck! God damn it, Vigo, fuck! The loss of Vigo is disappointing. I am sorry. 
We do not have a substantial amount of time to grieve. We must keep moving. Onru, Ross, Houston, Halo, and Irantu leave from the chamber. More rumbling is felt beneath them, and occasional loud screeching sounds punctuate the machine noises from this section of the facility. They reach a stairwell and Houston throws the door open. Whoa. What? What is the matter? There's nothing here. The door just opens up into... nothing. It's just dark as far down as I can see. It is likely that disabling the Thrusher device has altered our previous escape route. We will need to devise another path to the surface. Yes. One moment. Monroe, where are you? Difficult to say, unfortunately. Have you powered down the machine? We just did. Fine timing, then. We were being pursued by a creature, then suddenly there was a wall where the creature had been. The local topography appears to have reset itself. Stay in one place. We will come to find you. Our escape begins now. Fantastic. The main group leaves the empty stairwell and turns back down the hallway they came through. Passing by the Thresher access hallway again, they turn and begin to climb another staircase. As they reach the top, Irantu pauses. The hallway in front of them is covered ankle high in water. As they begin to move slowly through the water, one of the researchers behind them screams. What is it? Just below the surface of the water, pale human corpses are visible, appearing to be floating roughly a half meter down. Do not attempt to look at them. You do not recognize them. Move quickly, come on. The team hurries from the hallway towards another set of doors at the end, where written on the wall are the words what happened to Site 13, with the word what covered by the word Emerson, and the words have we become blasphemous beneath that. The group proceeds with our incident for a short while longer, slowly ascending as safe routes become available. After roughly eight minutes of travel, the group enters a large mechanical garage, where several pieces of large machinery sit in various states of repair. They pause to secure one of the injured survivors, while Onru attempts to devise a new route. Suddenly, a loud banging sound is heard, and a piece of machinery flies across the room, narrowly missing Ross, who shouts. Whoa! Fuck! Where'd that come from? In the corner of the room, a stack of mechanical parts is seen moving, rising up and self-assembling into a quasi-humanoid entity. Attached to the top of the large mechanical construct is a small, crudely constructed toy robot. The entity begins to move towards them, and a voice is heard from an unknown source within the entity. I am reborn to bring devastation upon this fatted earth. Pitiful humans, you will feel the dark state of my never-ending torment. This is... annoying. Onru, get these people out. Ross, to me. I am the herald of your destruction. Embrace death. Irantu, Ross, Houston, and Ahalo open fire on the entity, to little effect. The entity lifts another large piece of equipment and throws it towards the group, missing them wide. A halo throws a fragmentary grenade at the entity, which it catches in its outstretched hands and grips tightly. The grenade explodes, shattering the creature's hand and causing it to stagger sideways. How dare you! I will tread upon you like- Onru is seen sprinting towards the entity. As she approaches it, she leaps into the air, sailing over the top of it in a tall arc. As she reaches the top of the arc, she reaches out and grabs the small toy robot on top of the construct, causing it to collapse. As she flips towards the ground, she tosses the robot towards the wall. No, I am the Harbinger. I am. The toy robot strikes the wall and is shattered. Arontu, is that you? We just heard something crashing. You must be near. Stay where you are. We're on route. The group moves out of the garage and towards a large atrium section. From around the corner comes Munru and Nanku. Munru appears to have sustained burns to his lower body but is otherwise undamaged. Nanku is missing the lower half of her jaw, and black fluid covers the front of her bodysuit. She waves with her remaining hand as the group approaches. You look well. Admittedly, morale has increased in the group since Nanku found herself unable to talk. Nanku makes an obscene gesture towards Munru. This is a cute reunion, but let's get back to this shit. How far are we from the entrance? This is a main atrium. If we follow this hallway here, it will lead towards a processing station. And past that, we should find access points to the surface. Exceptional. From below them, there is a loud crashing sound and more screaming. The floor beneath the group begins to buckle. Fuck! Run! The group flees towards the hallway Munru has identified, but are stopped when the floor there also collapses. A plume of smoke erupts from the destroyed floor, and one researcher slips on the collapsing ground and slides into it. Onru leads the group away from the atrium as the floor there completely collapses. 
Irantu stops to turn and look down inside the hole. Beneath the hole is an incredibly large chamber, appearing to have been dug through dozens of layers of subterranean floors. Within the chamber are many small lights around the outside, and at the bottom is a massive black mass, with several other large black masses extending from it. As he is pulled away, Irantu sees red eyes open across the entire mass of the creature and hears more screaming. The group flees down a side hallway but are pursued by a long black tendril snaking out of the hole. Ross and Houston open fire on the tendrils, halting them momentarily, but they are quickly replaced by more. Morris is seen slipping on a patch of black liquid and falling before being consumed by the ends of one of the tendrils. There are the sounds of metal crashing and rock and concrete being crushed as the structure around them heaves violently. Black leeches begin to pour out of the walls around them and Nanku opens her flamethrower at them. They round a corner to find a dead end and turning back are confronted with another black tendril that has burst through a hole in the wall. Monru, we need a way out. I'm, I'm having difficulty. I... Wait, wait, I have an idea. I think I know where we are. I have an idea. Just... Come on, you fuckers, we're not dying here. The group follows Hollis towards a descending stairwell and move quickly down it. Hollis tosses an incendiary grenade towards the encroaching tendrils and slams the door shut behind her as it explodes. The screams from below them intensify as they descend and the stairwell begins to shake. Holes in the stairwell open and more leeches begin to pour out of them. All task force members open fire as long tendrils snake through the holes as well. Upon reaching a landing, Hollis motions the group towards the door. Here! In here! Go, go, go! The group enters a hallway and sprints towards the other end. As they do, they pass a sign on the wall that reads, Stairs to Cryonics. The group exits the hallway into a large observation section, passing many large windows with blast protectors down across them. The team stops in front of one window, overlooking a massive chamber lined with huge steel doors. Overhead are the words, Olympia Class Testing Observation. Hollis, what do you have in mind? Call it a hunch. We need to get downstairs, come on. The group runs towards the stairwell at the end of the room and quickly descend to the main level of the wing. As they exit onto the floor of the Olympia class containment chamber, the wall behind them begins to buckle and leeches begin to pour out of it. Pink Ranger, that panel over there. You need to get that door open. What? I said open the goddamn door, hurry! What the fuck are you waiting for, go! Onru runs towards a control panel near one of the tall steel doors. The wall behind them continues to buckle. Monru, that one, get that one open too. Yes, absolutely. Everyone else, listen to me. You civilians need to get to the far end of this room. As far as it goes, just keep running. There's an access point to the power station above this part of the facility. You need to just keep climbing until you get there. Once you're there, you need to blow a wall. That'll get you out. But you need to hurry. Shit is about to pop off in a pretty major way down here. Ross, you and your boys just fire at anything that comes out of that wall. I'll tell you when we can go. Irantu, you stay with me. This is gonna get pretty messy. Understood. All right, fucking go, come on! The group flees down the main pathway through the chamber away from the buckling wall. Behind them, the wall finally gives way and a gargantuan black slick entity pours into the chamber. It is at least 200 meters in height, covered in black tendrils and dark red eyes. When it sees the group, it opens a massive mouth full of rows of long yellow teeth. In the center of the mouth, a naked human woman is visibly conjoined in some way to a sort of prehensile tongue with the creature. As it opens its mouth, it lets out a piercing scream and begins to move towards the group. Every available task force member opens fire on the creature, emptying their remaining magazines and throwing every possible incendiary weapon towards it. The creature is deterred slightly, but for every place it is pierced by weapon fire, black fluid and more black leeches begin to pour out of its body. Several long tendrils begin to snake towards the group of task force members. I have it. I have it, Captain Hollis. Come on then, girl, throw the fucking thing! Onru steps away from the control panel and runs back towards the group in the middle of the chamber, as a loud groaning is heard behind her. The rest of the team sees the huge metal doors begin to slide open. A thick cloud of ice-cold fog rolls out of the chamber, obscuring the interior from view. What's in there? Monroe, you got yours? Hang on. Yeah, I think that'll do. Suddenly, the door behind Munru begins to glow bright red, then white, and then the center of it buckles and the door collapses. As Munru hurries away, a colossal, motionless, flaming humanoid entity floats out of the chamber. In its unmoving hands is a huge sword. As it exits the collapsed doorway, enormous flaming wings unfurl from its back. The black creature screams and its tendrils begin to lash at this creature. 
As the tendrils come close, long streaks of fire erupt from the sword towards them, rupturing them and sending black fluid and scorched leeches flying across the room. The massive black creature screams and dozens of other tendrils fly towards the flaming humanoid. As the two engage, there is another sound, like a long whining, and then suddenly the room is silent. From within the cold, foggy room, a towering, vaguely servine creature steps out into the main chamber. It is composed of a body covered in light green and cream-coloured hair, a long, thin neck ending in a hairless, somewhat humanoid face, and vast, intertwined white and black antlers that pulse with streaks of blue light. Floating above its head are nine concentric rings of glowing, rotating crystals and metallic spheres. The creature slowly steps out of the containment cell and turns to look at the team on the ground below. It opens its mouth and a long droning sound is heard throughout the room. Around its body, several large metallic cylindrical structures appear followed by a distinct cracking sound. It begins to step towards the team of Task Force members but is struck from behind by three black tendrils that wrap around its neck. The creature lets out another drone and suddenly the sound returns to the chamber as long streaks of fire arc across the space. The cylindrical constructs turn lengthways and speed across the room towards the black creature, striking it in its central mass. From all around the servine entity, more and more metallic spheres appear to fly towards both the black creature and the flaming humanoid, which in turn begin to attack each other. Fucking yes! Go get him, big guy! Time to fucking go, kids, let's go! The team begins to sprint after the group of civilians towards the far wall as jets of fire strike the ground around them. Nanku catches the end of a dismembered black tendril in the shoulder, throwing her off balance. She falls to the ground, firing openly with her weapon as she is engulfed in fire. Houston pauses briefly to turn towards her, but is grabbed by Rantu. We do not have time! As they near the group of survivors, all of whom are huddled near an exit door at the end of the chamber, there is a crashing sound, and they turn to see the servine entity standing up from where it had been thrown across the room. The black creature whips at it as more metallic spheres appear and arc back towards it. There is an eruption of fire as the flaming humanoid is struck by another several tendrils, which try to pull the humanoid towards the mouth of the black entity. The team reaches the survivors and quickly exit through the door. The group begins to quickly ascend the staircase within. All right, just like I said, up. We need to go up, over the- A long, thin metallic cylinder crashes through the wall of the stairwell, narrowly missing one of the researchers and Dr. Scott. A second cylinder comes through the wall, striking Irantu and obliterating him as it contacts the wall behind him. As the group continues to ascend, fire fills the stairwell below them, and another long, loud droning sound can be heard, followed by silence, and then followed by a thick, bursting sound that shakes the entire facility. The group reaches a landing and begins to move towards another staircase at the end of the hallway. Hollis hangs behind. What are you doing? Giving you some more time. And something else, I think. Get these people out of here, go! I can stay behind, Hollis. Your life is finite. Yeah, yeah, I get the spiel, Power Ranger, but right now you need to get these people out of here. Let me do my thing, all right? Catch up with you later. I understand. Good looking out, Hollis. <laughs> you almost sounded like a person there for a second, Monroe. Hollis runs away from the group. Munro catches up to the rest of the group who reach another staircase and begin to ascend. For the next 10 minutes, the group continues to ascend through the facility, several times narrowly avoiding debris and falling rubble as the lower levels of the site begin to collapse. The sounds of the entities below continue to be heard, and several times the creatures become visible through large gaps in the walls and floor. At one point, Ross catches sight of the unmoving, flaming humanoid nearly completely covered in metal as long streaks of fire burst through open seams in its encasement. Shortly afterwards, there is a two-minute break in all video footage, followed by a shot of the head of the servine creature smashing through a wall in front of the group. As they turn to run away from it, the head turns towards them, and two researchers are instantly transmuted into hexagonal columns of an unknown yellow-green material. After a short time longer, Ross begins to pick up a signal from Site Command. Team lead, this is Site Command. Do you read us? Holy fuck! Yes! Yeah, I do! Do you hear me? We do. You have appeared on our geolocating systems. Ross, you're not far from the exit. Where is Captain Hollis and Arantu? Arantu is dead. Hollis, she ran off a while back. We haven't seen her since then. Understood. What about the rest? We've suffered some casualties. Some... Fuck. We've lost a few of the civilians and Vigo and a few others. It's really bad in here right now. Command, we're gonna need all the help we can get. We... Monroe, where's Onru? She... Oh. She was behind us. Where is she? Don't worry about that now. We're 
Marking an extraction point on your visor. The extraction team is waiting for you there. We're going to get you all out. The group hurries towards the extraction point as the site continues to collapse around them. Above ground, aerial surveillance captures footage of large sections of the site sliding into the ground and smoke beginning to billow from the power station and nearby mechanical facilities. Jets of flame become visible as the earth beneath SCP-1730 begins to give way. Mobile Task Force Alpha-20 Holy Divers enters the site near the crumbling power station. The group of survivors comes into view and are immediately moved towards the access point and then away from the site by members of MTF-A-20. As the rest of the task force members are pulled away from the site, a separate transmission reaches site command originating from Onru. Onru and Hollis are standing in front of the Thresher device which roars with activity behind them. They are firing their weapons at an encroaching black mass in front of them which is punctured by streaks of fire. In the background, the Servine entity can be seen tearing through black tendrils with its antlers as long rods of flaming metal streak across the room towards the black entity. Hollis turns towards the camera and is visibly laughing, firing her weapon openly. The hum of the machine behind them grows noticeably louder, eventually overtaking all other sounds in the room. Streaks of electricity arc across the ceiling above them. She smiles and turns towards Onru, who looks down to find her torso has been destroyed by a jet of flame. As Onru slumps to the side, the last shot is of Hollis, laughing hysterically and wildly firing her weapon as the enormous machine behind her begins to glow bright white. There is a flash, and the transmission ends. Outside, as MTF-A20 continues to move 1730 researchers and personnel to safety, there is a deafening crackling sound, and a loud hum fills the air. The area around the site begins to visibly distort, as if seen through water, and then suddenly SCP-1730 is gone. In its place is an immense crater, over one kilometer in diameter. No other transmissions are received from within the site. No other anomalous activity is detected. End log. Mission Debrief, Captain Ephraim Ross, Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, Game Wardens. Begin log. Please state your name for the transcript. Captain Ephraim Ross, Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, Game Wardens. Thank you, Captain Ross. Alright, let's see. Your team was directed to infiltrate SCP-1730 and search for the source of the radio signal we were receiving. Is that correct? It is. Tell me about your initial incursion. You've listened to the logs. I haven't myself, no. They're still being processed. It wasn't good in there. Best I can tell wherever Site 13 came from. They were using it as a sort of end-of-line processing facility. Every so often we'd see placards up on these containment cells about how certain things were due for termination. Judging by what the Samsara team saw, that was about the case. They were bringing in anomalies, doing some invasive investigations to them and then destroying them. What sort of anomalies were being housed there? Could you tell? I mean, shit, it was really hard to tell. Somewhere along the line, the power had gone out and it had all gone Jurassic Park in there. Of just what we encountered, there was some kind of encroaching blackness that fucked up Houston's legs and... Have you seen Houston? Is he right? He's being looked at by medical right now. They're going to bring him over here soon. I think he's probably all right. That's good. Yeah, I'm, I mean... But other than that, there was also this thing. I don't know if it was a person or not, but it sort of bent space around it and, and no worry. It's okay, we can... No, this needs to be done. We took some losses on all of the teams. It, it was bad. Based on what we saw at the end, it could have gotten a lot worse too. At the end? They had these cells down below the site. They must have been the size of a football stadium each. Hollis had them open a few up so we could make our retreat and the things inside. One of them looked at me like I might look at an ant. It was like a god, and they had them in boxes. I counted 20 of these cells, but that chamber went on a lot further past what I could see. What were they keeping in those? How were they keeping them in there? End log. Mission debrief, Agent Liam Halo, Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, Game Wardens. Begin log. All right. If you could please state your name for the official transcript. Agent Ahalo. Agent, we really have to file this report. If you could just cooperate with me for a moment so I can get your official testimony. We have counsellors on site who can speak to you afterwards. Ahalo refuses to answer. Instead, he reiterates he and the rest of the team were supposed to die inside SCP-1730. Ahalo. 
End log. Mission debrief Iran 2, Mobile Task Force Tau 5, Samsara. Begin log. State your name for the record, please. I am Urantu, lead of Mobile Task Force Tau 5, Samsara. In your own words, please describe the events that took place while you were within SCP-1730. Of course. The Tau 5 team was inserted into SCP-1730 and began to move towards the source of the broadcast. Onru was able to track the location of the survivors and plotted a course towards them that would expose us to the fewest spatial hazards possible. Several times our course had to be adjusted due to unforeseen obstacles, but nothing that we were not able to overcome. Shortly after a rendezvous with Captain Hollis and the survivors, our extraction efforts led us through the section of the facility containing the Thresher machine which we believe is what resulted in SCP-1730's existence within our universe. Shortly thereafter, during our retreat, I was terminated. I see. As for Agent Morris, Vigo, and the others... They were also terminated. Terminated? Expired. Succumbed to their injuries. I know what it means, Arantu, I just... I can't help but feel as if you feel good about this. I feel neither good nor bad only satisfied at the outcome. What? Our extraction mission was a success. With minimal loss of life, our team was able to infiltrate the extremely hazardous and volatile spatial anomaly and extract several high-value persons of interest. I do not know what else you would like me to say. We were exposed to a number of dangerous anomalies and were able to successfully carry out our mission. There were regrettable losses of capable and experienced personnel, but not outside our margin of error. On the contrary, our team performed better than our preliminary models predicted. I see. Thank you, Irantu. I will be sure to include your remarks in the report. You are welcome. As is required by Cooperative Mission Protocol, I would like the opportunity to debrief with Zeta-9 Captain Hollis. Captain Hollis was killed within SCP-1730. Erantu? Regrettable. Captain Hollis expressed great resilience in the face of near certain failure. As protocol dictates, I will file my report in step with Captain Hollis's assigned site administrator's office. Thank you for your time, Doctor. End log. Mission debrief Agent Cotter Houston, Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, Game Wardens. Begin log. All right. First off, I need your name for our logs. Sure. I'm Cotter Houston, member of the Apollo 3 team. Good, good. Now, Agent Houston, describe to me your affliction here as much as you can. Well, I'm sure it's pretty clear, but I don't have uh, shins anymore. There's a, there's a line where the thing that covered them up came up to, and you can sort of sort of see the inside of the lake there. Like it's been replaced with a flat piece of glass or something. But I can still... you know... I can still walk. It doesn't really feel like I'm missing anything down there. It just looks like it. And you can... yeah, you can sort of run your hand through where they should be. Obviously, because they're not there. But... But I don't feel that either, so... yeah. I see. What can you tell me about this material you said you stepped in? It fell in, actually. Or rather, I tripped. And it sort of just kept coming. It was... Well, we opened a door, and it looked like there wasn't anything on the other side of it. Then it started to... like... It started to rise through the door and up the stairwell. You ever played video games? It was like some sort of graphical glitch. It wasn't rising fast or anything, just steady. We eventually got to a door, but that was after I fell, and then this. Can you tell me anything about the initial sensation? Initial sensation? Did it hurt? Oh, no, I mean, I didn't realize what was happening at first. Everybody else was panicking, and then I looked down and saw they were gone, and I started panicking, but... I mean, obviously I was alright. 
it never hurt, no. It just feels normal. Uh, well, not normal. It's obviously weird. My legs are missing, and I think I might be in shock. But every now and then, I can sort of feel something sort of brush past them. Brush past them? Yeah. I mean, the parts that are missing down there. I thought I was imagining it at first, like guys who have phantom pain. But it's... I mean... I can actually feel my legs, so I don't think it's that. It's like there's something sort of furry and kind of wet that just... just barely brushes past them. Who knows? End log. Mission debrief, Munru, Mobile Task Force Tau 5, Samsara. Begin log. When did you lose track of Captain Hollis? In the chaos of our retreat, Captain Hollis was separated from us. I do not know when. Munru, your camera was undamaged. We know you spoke to her before she left. Damn. I'm not very good at that. Why didn't you keep her from leaving your group? I assumed that any decision she would make in regards to her own personal behavior would be made with her experience and training in mind, both of which exceeded my own. Additionally, she outranked me. Your mission parameters forbade you from allowing other team members from putting themselves in harm's way and required that you do everything you could to mitigate loss of life. How do you reconcile your actions with those requirements? Technically speaking, nothing I did allowed Captain Hollis to put herself in any danger. I could not foresee the outcome of her actions and use my best judgment to justify my own. For all I knew, she could have been moving to a safer location. Away from the group. It would be illogical to assume that an agent with her level of experience would purposefully endanger themselves in an unpredictable situation. And you believe your justifications are an acceptable interpretation of your mission protocols? Of course. Very well. When you return to holding, you will be meeting with Arantu to discuss this. I hope your arguments hold up. As do I. End log. Mission debrief, Onru, Mobile Task Force Tau 5, Samsara. Begin log. Why did you pursue Captain Hollis? I believed I understood Captain Hollis's intentions before she left the group, based on her discussions with the team leads before we began our extraction. I feared that she might have not been capable of returning along our previous course without my assistance. Your recording equipment went dark for a long period before becoming active again in the fresher area. What happened during that time? Onru, I'm going to need an answer. I disabled the equipment. There was a room we passed through that was different than it had been before. It was the server room above the Olympia containment cells. I do not know how our path ended up there. I had not intended it to. It was a mistake. When we entered, it was on the room it had been, but... What do you mean? I am... I am sorry, it is difficult to describe. When we entered the door, I could see the servers around me, but superimposed over them was... We were standing on a precipice, overlooking an area of size of which I cannot estimate. Below us were humans, screaming, their arms ending at their wrists, crying to the silent sky for restitution. And then... the sky burned. It was like a star had fallen, and I had to look away. Hollis could not. When I turned back, I could see scorched corpses on the ground. Billions of them. But billions of other living beings who came rushing toward the fallen star with their arms outstretched and hanging in the star like a twisted marionette was... At Site 13, they called it Maladramaduan. In this place, they called it another name. A hateful name. Why did you disable your recording equipment? When I first encountered this entity, it created anomalous mimetic and cognitive hazards powerful enough to burn the scramble units out of my eyes. I do not know what it would have done to anyone who was not otherwise protected. What did it do to you? It... showed us things. Visions. Coils of fire and a sky made light with a storm of souls. A hole at the center of the universe that screamed at me. A god. 
of nightmares. Something long and lean, slowly walking between endless rows of crucifixions, and then it showed something to Hollis that I did not see. When it did, the runes across its its head began to pulse and burn, and the man who was strapped there to blister and fester. When it was done, I saw an ocean behind it and a blue sky. Our sky. It turned toward the ocean and sank into it. When it was gone, the visions faded and the room was empty. I see. After that? Hollis ran. I followed her. She said nothing until we reached the machine. She told me that she had been there alone for some time. She said she knew how to turn it on. Then she said she did not know where she would go, but that she needed to take the things she saw and bury them in the darkness. Before she could start the machine, the creatures from the containment cells came into the chamber, and I was terminated. Did Captain Hollis say anything to you before you died? No. She only laughed. And wept. End log. Mission debrief Dr. Mohammed Scott, Site 13 Assistant Director of Temporal Studies. Begin log. Please state your name for the record. My name is Dr. Mohammed Scott. You seem to be a little out of place, Dr. Scott. <laughs> Only a little. Our timelines were not so different, I think. Except for the one thing. Yes, there is that. Tell me about Site 13. A Site 13? Do you want the brief version, or...? As far as you can be. Very well. Originally, there were plans to build a large containment facility in the American Midwest, but that was before... Let me back up. In 1964, the Foundation discovered a massive dead sea creature washed up on the shore near the Indian-Bangladeshi border. No facility in the region had the kind of infrastructure it took to hold the body of this entity, let alone study it, so several ships were dispatched, and it was dragged through the ocean back towards the United States. Prior to this, the plan was to build Site-19 in the American Midwest, but afterwards it was decided that there was no way to conceal a creature of this size and shuttle it across the U.S. mainland, so after some deliberation, the Site-19 plans were scrapped and the focus was given to another facility near Nome, Alaska. Uh, that was Site-13. Even in the beginning, it was massive, considerably larger than any other site the Foundation managed, and it quickly became our premier containment facility. It was remote, fortified, and best of all, easily concealed in the snow and ice. After the Soviet Union collapsed in 85, we learned they didn't even know Site-13 existed, let alone where it was. I see. When did you join the Foundation, Dr. Scott? Oh, uh, in 76. I joined straight out of university, recruited by one of the administrators at my school, and that was back when we were still independent. I worked at Site-22 in Bermuda. It's the best job I ever had. It was a much different foundation. Tell me about what happened to the foundation. Site-13 was very expensive to operate, and there were some financial difficulties. In 1994, a Marxist extremist from the Ukraine detonated a bomb in the basement of the Manchester Financial Tower in Chicago. A fire started at the base of the building, and eventually the tower collapsed at its base and fell over on its side. Thousands died. The United States government was enraged at the foundation after it was discovered that the extremists in question had used an anomaly to enter the basement and get past security. Thought that the billions of dollars the United States was funneling into the foundation were being wasted. After the 1996 election, President Dole decided to cut all funding for foundation sites in the states, and all available funding went to keeping those sites afloat. With the weight of Site 13, the situation was dire. So what happened? A compromise. A former Dole staffer named Paul Manafort was appointed as the Secretary General of the Global Occult Coalition and came to us with a solution. We group our resources with the coalitions, combining our efforts to protect normalcy under their leadership. We could keep our name and our sites, but directors would be appointed by the UN Security Council. And we would once again receive funding from the United States, as well as that generated by the United Nations, and would be able to keep the lights on. But... But the Overseer Council refused. They hunkered down at Overwatch Command and refused to bend the knee. Then, a few years later, a site in Portland, Oregon collapsed due to crumbling infrastructure and a creature we called the Dream Whale was spotted floating down the California coast. This was very early internet days, but that didn't stop film cameras and it was a disaster. The Overseers mobilized all of our task forces in the area, but we didn't even have money for the amnestics. In a day, it would be over San Francisco and that would basically be the end of it. 
Then we got an internet email that the Overseer Council had been disbanded and that the Foundation was now under the operation of the GOC. Secretary General Manafort and the Security Council established a new board of directors overnight, and before the sun rose, the dream whale was recontained and every loose end was tied up. Nobody resisted the change in leadership. Why would we? We suddenly had money. We were no longer having to decide between taking notes on the back of our hands or not taking them at all. Secretary General Manafort installed a new Foundation Administrator, Vice President Jack Kemp. But he was a little more than a figurehead. New directors were appointed, most of them from our own site staff, so it looked good, honestly. We were finally able to carry out our mission to its fullest. We had technology, we had personnel. It was wonderful. We started to hear about people being reassigned. Anomalies being shipped off-site and never returning. You'd hear people talk about, Oh, so-and-so is in trouble now, they're going to be sent to Site-13. I thought most of it was just talk, and then I was reassigned in 2003. What was it like? Cold. Site 13 was immense and the lights stayed on, but that facility was always cold. They were always working on the site, more and more construction underground, and they kept leaving the exterior doors open. At first it wasn't so bad. I was able to keep doing my research, I had more funding than ever. Temporal spatial studies, you know? The director then was Jack Bright, one of the old doctors from back in the day. Very charismatic, staff loved him. Uh, he had a medallion he wore, some anomaly from way back that made him immortal. So as long as he had it on, he wouldn't age. Anyway were great for a few years, then one day, another popular doctor is found dead in her office, Cynthia Light. The story we get is that Bright had fancied her, but when he found she was with another man, he went and killed her in a fit of passion, so. Bright is summarily locked up, and Elliot Emerson is installed as the director of Site-13. What's that? Emerson was on one of Bright's research teams when he was assigned to Site-15. He wasn't a popular doctor, but he was a good administrator and helped make sure that the important project stayed afloat during the financial crisis. He was on the short list of people to become the director of Site-13 after the reorganization, but Bright got picked over him. Some people said he felt slighted. A lot of people said he framed Bright. I think Manafort didn't like Bright's anti-coalition sentiments. Had it made out to be some dangerous anomaly that had to be contained and then put Emerson up because nobody would complain about Emerson. He was very middle of the road and stand out. Elliot ended up doing some terrible things, but I truly believe he was only doing them because Manafort demanded it. What kind of terrible things? I didn't see much until years later, but I always heard about things happening deeper below the site. They were building all the new containment cells and research facilities, then they built the incinerator. Originally it was made so they could dispose of the body of that sea monster from before, but then they just started using it for everything. First they were doing some invasive testing on anomalous animals, then on humans, then the vivisections began. The Ethics Committee tried to step in, but they were removed. They dragged the old chairman, Jeremiah Sumerian, out into the commons at Site-17 and shot him in the head for being a traitor. Peter Grinwald became the Foundation GOC Ethics Head, and of course, all the new tests were approved. I don't know what they were testing for, but if you were anomalous and you weren't found to have it, you went into the body pit. I kept hearing, it's for the greater good, it's for the protection of mankind. What were we supposed to do, speak out and end up like Sumerian? Maybe for a braver man, but I knew the work I was doing was good, so I kept my head down and carried on. And, well, it sounds silly now. In 2010, we contained God. Not just any God, either. The actual, the Abrahamaic God. The actual thunder and lightning, Yahweh, fire, brimstone God. I don't know how they managed it. Some technology developed by the Coalition, I'm sure. And that was just the first. They filled Site-13 to the brim with everything they could get their hands on. Well, that is... a lot. I guess the only other question I have immediately is... What happened to Site-13? Vera Hadley. Doctor of Internal Medicine from some site in Italy. For a few years, she was the site's chief biologist. The Security Council made her the assistant director of anomalous biology at the same time I was promoted to the same position for temporal studies. She and Elliot had been... together. And she pretty adamantly opposed everything he was making us do. Elliot kept his tail between his legs, but Manafort wouldn't have it. He had her stripped of her position after just three months and demoted to junior researcher after that. One night, after staging some kind of demonstration, some guards showed up and, well, they stripped her naked and inspected her for contraband right in the middle of the main corridor. When they were done and satisfied, they nearly beat her to death and left her there. Myself and a few other doctors took her to the medical center and she recovered, but she never really recovered. 
Something inside her had died or been replaced with something else. She did something, hatched some scheme. She sent me an email about it the night before she did it, but I didn't pay attention. When it happened, and when that thing attacked the site, Emerson came and begged me to turn on the thresher. It was supposed to be an absolutely last-ditch effort to protect the world, a wholly untested piece of technology that was just as likely to have burned the world than saved it. Its entire existence was the result of a joke, one that I might have taken too seriously at the time, but either way, I refused, told him the risk was too great, that even if it worked, we were just creating a problem for another world, but he was inconsolable. He told me that staying and facing the Secretary General would be a fate worse than death. He pulled a gun on me, demanded I do it, fled. I went to gather my team in the hopes that we could escape, but before we could even leave our lab, it happened. Are you alright? Yes. The Thresher was a complicated machine. I, I guess I should count myself lucky that we survived at all, but we may very well have been in that strange space between worlds for a thousand years. When we awoke, we were still in Site 13, but the cells were thrown open and the inmates were loose. And if you hadn't come down for us, we would have died certain of this. Do you know where Site 13 has gone? There's no way to predict it. Chances are it'll be at a place like this. But then, it may not. It could be any number of strange and unknown worlds. You knew someone who was left with that. I do. As do I. We were not the only survivors, though there were not many of us. They... well, they did not fare as well as we did. It is a tragedy. There is nothing that can be done now. Only hope. Maybe. I hope that after all this, Emerson has found some peace. He truly was a great doctor, and... was my friend. I... of course. Thank you for your time, Dr. Scott. We'll speak again soon. End log. The best way to understand SCP-1730 is to take all the information we can gain from the file and create a chronology of events. Most of the answers to many of our questions are not answered until the end of the file, so to understand what happened to Site-13, I'm going to walk us through it from beginning to end and answer all your questions and finally explain what happened to Site-13. Firstly, we need to establish that there are two universes in this SCP. There is the universe where SCP-1730 came from, and our own universe where SCP-1730 ended up. Think of the other universe as like a parallel version of our universe, where things are mostly the same, but a little bit different. The other universe is where the timeline begins. We start our story in 1964, where a massive dead sea creature washed up on the shores of the Indian-Bangladeshi border. The creature was so large that there was no Foundation facility that possessed the infrastructure to contain it. The SCP Foundation had plans to build a new site, Site-19, in the middle of bumfuck nowhere, somewhere in the US. But the creature was so large that there was no way the Foundation could have transported it there without it being noticed. In the end, the plans to build Site-19 were scrapped, and instead Site-13 was built in Alaska. Site-13 was to be the biggest and grandest Foundation facility ever constructed. It also had the benefit of being remote, fortified and concealed. Once it was built, the sea creature was hauled away by ship to the new site. We now jump ahead to 1976. This is where Dr. Scott enters the story. Dr. Scott is the man who would eventually go on to reveal the lion's share of information on Site-13 to the SCP Foundation in our own universe during his debrief. Dr. Scott was recruited as an SCP researcher straight out of university and toddled off to begin his career at Site-22 in Bermuda. We jump ahead now to 1994. A Marxist extremist blew up a building in Chicago, resulting in the death of thousands. An investigation revealed that the terrorists used an anomalous device in order to bypass security without being detected. The United States government was royally pissed off at this and claimed that the billions of dollars of funding given to the SCP Foundation was wasted money and in 1996, they suspended all funding. Now what with Site-13 being the biggest Foundation site ever constructed, the upkeep wasn't cheap, and the Foundation soon found themselves strapped for cash. The Secretary General of the GOC, a lovely chap called Paul Manafort, came to the O5 Council of the SCP Foundation with a proposal. He basically said, look, you guys sail under our colours, let us appoint the guys in charge and we'll give you even more money than before and you can even keep your brand and your sights. The O5 Council harnessed their inner Simon Pegg and said, Jog on. 
A few years of crumbling infrastructure later and a creature called the Dream Whale escaped containment and went for a joyride down the California coast. The Foundation did what they could but their forces were withered and bare by now and they didn't have the money for an effective amnestics program anymore. This was when the GOC said enough was enough and in less than a day they launched a takeover of the SCP Foundation and disbanded the O5 Council. They appointed a new board of directors to oversee everything and the Dream Whale was recontained before the next day. For the next few years, all was rosy. The SCP Foundation soared to new heights under the control of the GOC. They had funding, technology, personnel, and they could complete every mission and assignment to the fullest. It was the glory years for them. During this time though, Site-13 began to establish a reputation for being a bit of a hellhole. Anomalies would be sent there never to be seen again, and staff would be transferred there if they found themselves in hot water. Dr. Scott was one of the unlucky ones to be transferred to Site-13 in 2003. Site 13 at this time was in a constant state of growth. The funding was pouring in, more so than any other site. There was greater research being done on things such as temporal and spatial studies, and the site was always being expanded with more floors and containment wings being built. Now here we get into some juicy workplace drama. At the time, Dr. Bright was in charge of Site 13. Now Dr. Bright did not care very much for the GOC, nor the takeover and frequently made anti-GOC sentiments that ticked off the GOC secretary, General Paul Manafort. At the same time, one of Dr. Bright's colleagues, a guy called Dr. Elliot Emerson, held a grudge against Dr. Bright because Bright was picked over Emerson as the director of Site 13, despite Emerson's squeaky clean record, decades of dedicated loyalty, and Emerson being very high up on the shortlist to become the Site 13 director. Manafort used Emerson to sort out his Dr. Bright problem. Another researcher called Cynthia Light was murdered, and Dr. Bright was framed for the murder. He was locked up, and Dr. Emerson was made the new director of Site 13, his loyalties being not to the SCP Foundation, but to Paul Manafort. Over the next few years, Site 13 turned into a death camp for the anomalous. A colossal incinerator was constructed to destroy the anomalies that Site 13 no longer had need of. It's important to know that Emerson didn't hate the anomalies, at least not yet. He was an original loyal SCP Foundation researcher prior to the takeover after all. Rather, he was just in Paul Manafort's debt and owed his position and the removal of Bright to him. Manafort had his own agenda of course being from the GOC, who are more about destroying the anomalies instead of containing them. And so horrendous experiments were conducted on them, two of which we are made aware of in the recovered files. One was a class 8 reality bender. They cooked it, they froze it, they drowned it, and they electrocuted it. Each time they used another SCP to revive it just so they could experiment on it again. In the end, the entity was so extensively damaged that even the unnamed SCP could not revive it, and it was sent to the incinerator. Another was a humanoid creature that originally resisted the experiments, but eventually succumbed and after it was butchered by Site-13 researchers, it became the writer on the walls an entity we see a couple of times that writes cognito hazardous on the walls. Now at some point hereafter the ethics committee tried to step in but they were quickly shut down and the chairman Dr. Sumerian got his brains blown out for his trouble. A new puppet ethics committee was put in place, all loyal to Emerson and Manafort. They approved all the diabolical experiments and justified it by saying it was to protect humanity. By 2010, Site 13 was now containing actual gods and other entities beyond comprehension. Examples include the Gate Guardian, the Deer, and as claimed by Dr. Scott, the real deal Abrahamic Thunder and Lightning God, most likely SCP-343, depending on which canon you follow. Now we don't know how they did it, and in fact even trying to comprehend the science or witchcraft required to contain the Gate Guardian for example is just crazy. Thanks to all the research into spatial and temporal studies as well as all the experiments on reality vendors, I like to think the GOC by now had access to some pretty sophisticated equipment capable of literally moving the Guardian from one place to another by manipulating reality around it. It is at this point in our story that another character enters the fold, a lady called Dr. Vera Hadley. She was the chief biologist for a time but was later promoted to assistant director of anomalous biology. Now she and Emerson were together for a time and she fundamentally opposed everything Emerson was doing and because Emerson didn't want to sleep alone he became a simp for her. But dear old Paul Manafort was having none of that and he had her demoted to junior researcher and her and Emerson's relationship ended on very bad terms. Dr. Hadley wrote a letter to the new ethics committee formally requesting to be transferred away from Site 13 and all the baggage that came with it. She cited her concerns for Emerson's treatment of the anomalies and her disdain towards the overall attitude to killing everything. Of course, the ethics committee were loyal to Emerson and so they rebutted her accusations and denied her transfer request. 
Dr. Hadley later went on to stage a demonstration against what was going on in Site 13. She was stripped naked and beaten half to death by the security teams in front of everyone to both punish her and set an example to the other staff. After seeing Dr. Sumerian executed and Dr. Hadley stripped and beaten, the status quo of Site 13 was cemented. However, dear viewer, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned, so they say. While Dr. Hadley recovered from her wounds, she never mentally recovered, and so she hatched a plan. A plan filled with hate and anger and despair. A plan so catastrophic that it would literally tear a hole in the fabric of reality itself. Like I said, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. During her time, Dr. Hadley worked with an anomaly called Elijah, a young boy with the mental capacity of a two-year-old. The boy subsisted only on blood and could siphon it right through people's skin like a leech. Dr. Hadley grew attached to Elijah, and when Emerson decided to have the boy transfer to the incinerator, this would prove to be the catalyst to begin Dr. Hadley's revenge. Firstly, she began to put some things in place. Dominoes, if you like. So when shit hit the fan, every domino would fall one after the other, resulting in a crescendo of fucked up. Site 13 had been in the process of constructing and perfecting a vague reality altering device known as the Thresher device. It was meant to be a final failsafe to save the world in a last ditch attempt if all else failed. All the research on temporal and spatial studies fed into this thing. However, it was unstable, untested, and unreliable. At the same time, Site 13 was destroying so many anomalies so fast that the incinerator could not keep up with demand, and the engineers noted that the excess waste, instead of being pumped off site, was instead being sucked up via the air intake into Site 13's reactor. Dr. Hadley instructed the engineers that at the next activation phase of the fresher device, the Site 13 reactor should surge to 55 gigawatts and activate the device. Of note is that the regular activation phase was only 35 gigawatts, and the engineer shared his concerns that firing up the device at 55 gigawatts would likely result in the destabilization of local reality and a full reactor failure. Dr. Hadley also instructed the engineers to adjust the incinerator parameters and confirmed that the waste runoff was still blocked. And at last, the dominoes fell. When Elijah was deposited into the incinerator, the fire was not enough to destroy him, thanks to Dr. Hadley adjusting the incinerator parameters. Instead, the fires just agitated him, and thanks to Dr. Hadley ensuring the waste runoff was still blocked, Elijah now had a near unlimited supply of anomalous blood to feed on. Elijah feasted on the blood turning into a colossal creature fueled by thousands and thousands of anomalous entities. The situation quickly grew completely out of control. Dr. Hadley sent a final message to Emerson chastising him for everything he had done and said he could either stay here and be devoured by the entities he had been torturing or activate the Thresher device and hope it would send him somewhere safe. Either way, the world would be free of his filth. She then went to join Elijah, where she would also be assimilated into the mass. However, maybe out of some residual awareness for her, Elijah, instead of consuming Dr. Hadley, conjoined her to his tongue so the two would exist together. Emerson, after realizing what had happened, went to Dr. Scott and ordered him to activate the Thresher device. Dr. Scott refused, citing the risks of doing so, and managed to escape with his staff after Emerson pulled a gun on him. A team, Charlie Yukon, was dispatched to try and recover Site 13, but by now the situation was well past the point of recovery. The team noted a number of leeches, one of which killed one of their team members. The other team members stumbled across a cognito hazard left by the writer on the walls that had now breached containment. They used explosives to destroy the wall, but the effects had already begun to manifest in their team. It is at this point that they heard the Thresher device fire up. The situation here went from bad to worse. Thanks to Dr. Hadley ensuring the waste runoff was still blocked, lots of the excess waste was still being sucked up the air intake into the reactor as the engineer had alluded to earlier. In addition, Dr. Hadley ensured that the reactor would surge to 55 gigawatts when the Thresher device was activated. Due to this surge in power and the lack of adequate cooling, the reactor failed, resulting in several catastrophic system failures across the site. Of the 12 reactor cores, only two remained functional, one being superheated. The electrical, fire control, flood control, and Keter class containment systems all shut down, with the reactor and Euclid class containment systems left in critical condition. The fresher device entered its final phase, and Site 13 was transferred across dimensions into our own universe, and that is where the main story picks up. In our own universe now, the SCP Foundation stumbles across Site 13. They note how there were plans to build Site 13, but it was scrapped to build Site 19 instead. 
They also note the site is in a severe state of disrepair, with a damaged reactor, fuel and fire leaks, and intermittent power failures. They also identify flora inside native to the Alaskan region. The Foundation sends in MTF D12 the Mudslingers. The first thing they discover is writing on the wall saying get below and don't look at the walls. This is a pretty common occurrence going forward. Plenty of messages can be found written on the walls of the site, presumably left behind by leech puppets and victims of the writer on the walls. Disturbingly, it seems the further into the bowels of the site they venture, the more unhinged the messages become. The mudslingers go down an elevator and begin exploring several rooms, some filled with an unknown sludge. This sludge is the same waste runoff that got sucked up the air intake into the Site 13 reactor. It has been deposited around Site 13 thanks to the unstable reality of the site. They find some bodies and engage a few leeches before realizing the topography has changed and their way back has disappeared. They happen across a door marked silence and choose to smash the fucking thing down and come face to face with a naked humanoid with fire coming out of its ears. The team screams and the humanoid blows up. Site Command hears a variety of wet sounds which is the leeches attacking the dead or dying team members before communication is lost. Site Command re-establishes communication with a couple of team members who encourage Site Command to send a recovery team and advise against Site Command's attempts to get their body cameras working. The cameras come back online to reveal both the team members are in fact dead and the sounds of the leeches can be heard in the background. Obviously, this was the leeches using the dead agents as puppets and trying to get the Foundation to send more bodies for them to feed on. The Foundation next sends MTF Y24, the Gulliver's Travelers. They head towards the reactor and note the damaged cores and the superheated one. They find more of the sludge and note several human bodies bound to the side of the reactor core with the words what happened to Site 13 written beneath them. The team follows some power lines from the reactor headed towards the body pit, but then their communications fail and Site Command loses all contact with the team. A week later, and the team's body cameras come back online for a few seconds and show a group of survivors standing around before cutting out permanently. Evidently, one of the team members found the survivors. This is supported by the testimony of the game wardens, who would enter the site later and tell Site Command that they found one of the Gulliver's travelers with the survivors. The Foundation next sends in a drone. The drone finds more writing on the walls, this time saying kill the quiet ones and don't look at the walls. This is all in reference to the cognitohazardous effect of the writer on the walls. The drone then happens across the writer on the walls, now wandering the halls of Site 13. You'll remember the writer on the walls is the same entity that originally resisted the Site 13 staff's butchery, but eventually succumbed. The drone watches the writer use some of the sludge on the floor to write several symbols on the walls. After taking some photos, it loses track of the writer and instead begins exploring some containment cells, one of which contains the corpse of the imprisoned Dr. Bright minus their amulet. It would seem Dr. Bright was never released after their imprisonment and died from thirst or starvation after the whole site went to pot. Furthermore, the amulet was confiscated to ensure he could not come back. The drone makes its way to an office floor and finds the computer of Dr. Hadley. It transfers the files on the computer back to Site Command before communication is lost with the drone. The attending staff who witnessed the symbols on the wall left behind by the writer all begin to show an anomalous influence, growing silent with fire burning from their ears. This is the effect of the writer on the walls and it turns out the writing is a pyroclastic cognitohazard that affects anyone aware of the symbols. The slightest noise will cause the affected people to explode. Needless to say, most of the research team and their equipment was destroyed. I have made a separate video of the writer on the walls and you can find that here. The Foundation next send in MTF Zeta 9, the Mole Rats. They are equipped with specialized goggles designed to filter out the cognitohazardous writing. They come across more sludge and dozens of dead bodies drained of blood by the leeches. Two agents are killed by leeches in falling debris, while communications with the rest of the team are lost save for a few sporadic intermittent communications and a short camera clip from one of the agents. Observing the prime leech creature in a large pit covered in smaller leeches with several broken pipes draining into it. An audio transmission is soon detected from Site 13. It is Dr. Scott revealing he and several others are still alive within Site 13 and are requesting help and extraction. The SCP Foundation decides to begin conducting search and recovery missions. MTF Apollo 3, the game wardens go in. They go down a stairwell to find a void at the bottom which quickly begins to ascend. It envelops one of their team members' legs, removing them just below the knee without any adverse effects. The team member is still able to walk and can even feel the sensation of having his lower legs, they just aren't there anymore. The agent would later go on to say that he can feel something brushing against them on occasion. I believe this is a reference to SCP-529, better known as Josie the Cat, who is also missing her legs, and what Houston is feeling is the back half of Josie rubbing up against his legs like a cat would. 
They find more writing on the walls before finding a body conjoined with the wall in an apparent reality warping incident. They identify this person as Zachary. This is SCP-1500. The team is then attacked by a reality bender that attacks two of the team members. A reality anchor dispatches the anomaly, but one of the team members is fused across 10 meters of wall and ceiling. The team move through a chamber containing colossal containment cells before entering a communications area where they encounter a camera feed of SCP-993, Bubble the Clown. Bubble reveals most of what we already know by now, including how Site-13 even managed to burn down the Wanderer's library, which again demonstrates a haunting reality of just how powerful the GOC were by this point. The library is a whole separate reality unto itself and will resist anything that attempts to harm it. Bubble wishes the team well as they leave the room. Communications with the team are lost but eventually are re-established. While the communications have only been lost for 30 minutes, three days has passed inside Site-13 thanks to the reality distortion. The game wardens have by now found Dr. Scott and the other survivors but know their situation is deteriorating rapidly and are in need of urgent assistance. Site Command tells them to prep for evac and the MTF Samsara are on the way. The Foundation sends in MTF Tau-5 Samsara. They enter through a drainage tunnel and come across several charred bodies from the incinerator. They scale the pipes and force their way through a wall into the main building of Site-13. They find one of the incinerators still blocked thanks to Dr. Hadley's orders. They turn on the incinerator and several turbines spool up turning the bodies into a slurry before several jets of fire scorch the remains. The team moves through the incinerator before encountering a leech that begins feasting on the slurry. Onru uses a tool to study the creature's brain and reveals that all the leeches act like fingers of the prime leech below them. They are merely extensions searching the site for more blood. They are infesting the site and the team uses this to create a map for them to better understand the topography. The team use this to both locate the survivors and decide on a route to take to get them to their location. The team sets off and finds more writing on the walls, this time it is just the word blood written over and over again. They come to the server room and note the leeches act really strange in there. As they enter, they experience a cessation in sound and note a drop in temperature to negative 20 degrees Celsius. They eventually discover a creature referred to as the Maladramarduan, a super powerful many-limbed reality bender. This creature is actually this universe's version of the SCP-001 proposal by Dr. Gears, better known as the prototype. I made a whole video on this creature that you can find here. Emerson is discovered to be strapped to the head of this creature in an eternal cycle of torment and punishment. The team are attacked but manage to escape and soon find the survivors. With everyone prepped to go, the team begins their escape. They soon encounter the writer on the walls who attacks them with several cognito hazards. The writer is promptly shot and killed by the team, however part of the prime leech then smashes its way through the floor, consumes the writer's body and begins to flood the floor with leeches and attack the group. Munru and Nanku of Tau-5 stay behind to provide cover fire while the rest of the group diverts another way. The group soon encounters SCP-553, the crystal butterflies. Irantu destroys them but is severely damaged in the process. The group then make their way to the Thresher device chamber but the room is sealed. Bubble the Clown appears on a monitor and lets them in. He refers to a character called Tammy who I cannot identify, so if you have any idea on who that is, please share it in the comments. They enter the Thresher chamber and note hundreds of creatures hanging from the ceiling. The wall then falls and a massive part of the prime leech enters the chamber. The commotion wakes the creatures on the ceiling that begin attacking the leech and the group as they run for the Thresher device. The group provides cover fire as Irantu and Onru head for the Thresher device and disable it by entering the information provided by Dr. Scott. A second leech extension smashes its way through the floor and begins flooding the room with smaller leeches. The team escapes the room but by disabling the Thresher machine, the topography has all reset. Walls have suddenly appeared and some doors now open to nowhere. The team encounters SCP-2316, the bodies in the water, and finds more writing on the walls, this time saying, Emerson happened to Site-13 and, have we become blasphemous? The team enter a garage and have a short fight with SCP-1370 before regrouping with Munru and Nanku, both of which are injured. Captain Hollis, the Mole Rats team captain, leads the group towards the Olympia-class containment wing as the leeches pursue them through the crumbling site. The team opens two of the Olympia containment cells as the prime leech breaks down the wall. It screams and opens its mouth to reveal Dr. Hadley fused to its tongue. From out of the open cells come both SCP-001, the Gate Guardian, and SCP-2845, the Deer. The three entities begin to attack each other and the group uses the distraction to make their escape. Several members of the group are killed in the escape as the fight between the entities begins to destroy the site. I've seen a fair bit of discussion and received a few comments regarding the possible victor in the fight between these three titans, and in my opinion, I think the deer would win. 
We can see that the leech, while strong, doesn't possess much in the way of anomalous power and relies on strength and numbers. The gay guardian gave both the deer and the leech a hard time, but we also see it encased in metal at one point, suggesting SCP-2845 was able to manipulate the elements so that the fire effects of the guardian were reduced. Finally, at the end of the log, we can see that the guardian is absent entirely, and the deer is still there tearing through the leech with antlers while launching flaming rods at it as well. So yeah, I put my money on the deer. Hollis and Onru separate themselves from the group and head back to the thresher machine while the rest of the group begins heading for the surface. The group is evacuated to safety by Foundation assets above, while Onru and Hollis set the Thresher device to activate at full power again while trying to defend against the entities. The Thresher device activates once more, and Site-13 and everything in it disappears from our universe. Given the reactor's severely damaged state, it's safe to assume that this was the final time the Thresher device could be used, and wherever Site-13 ended up, it's there permanently and without power. So it's just a dark, derelict hell filled with vengeful, bloodthirsty creatures constantly changing topography and a destroyed nuclear reactor possibly leaking radiation, a labyrinth of pain and suffering. So, what happened to Site-13? Emerson wanted power, and he got it, and then he wanted more and more. His relationship with Dr. Hadley proved to be his undoing, though. Dr. Hadley's compassion for the anomalous, in particular her love for Elijah, was a thorn in Emerson's side, and when he refused her transfer and had her beaten and then gave Elijah a death sentence, he had finally opened Pandora's box and sentenced them all to hell. Hadley created a monster out of Elijah, opened every containment cell, and ripped a hole in the fabric of space when the Thresher device was activated by Emerson on a last-ditch attempt to save his sorry ass. In the end, Emerson was bound to the Maladrum Arduin, and Hadley was bound to the Leech, both doomed to live in their respective torments with the monsters they created for eternity. And that is what happened to Site-13. This video is the summation of two years of work, and it would not have been possible without both my patrons, but also the huge number of incredible people who voiced the characters for this series. All the names are on screen now, and all the links can be found below. I would like to thank each and every one of them. I am so grateful for all of you contributing your voices to this series. Check out this video for another great story. Please leave a like and subscribe if you've made it this far. And thank you to Viger, Infinite Tune, Techno Ninja, Ryan Brenner, Andre Bachert, and Matthew Duncan.